Welcome again. This is episode 15 of the Clive Barker podcast. I'm Ryan Danhauser, and with me today is Jose Leitao, and a special guest, Matt Harpold. Hey, guys. Hello. And uh, Matt designed the banner for our website, if you've been there, and uh, he's he's a freelance artist, and he also, you can see more of his stuff on DeviantArt under Turbine Divinity, and uh, TurbineDivinity.com. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, haven't, I haven't been, like, updating that site, though. DeviantArt is where I am starting to put, like, more new stuff, like, as of now. So that's, that's probably the best place to, to, to go. Did you see that Clive Barker's on DeviantArt now? Yes. All right. Well, before we get into Clive Barker news, uh, let's go into the, Cli- the uh, Occupy Median report with Crystal Rain. Once again, Occupy Median has received some wonderful news. The Nightbreed Cabal Cut screening in Los Angeles, California grew to two screenings that both sold out. This, in addition to the hard work that everyone has put in to raise awareness of this film, has brought about a wonderful thing. On June 12th, Clive Barker announced on his Twitter, My friends, Clive here, writing to share some wonderful news. Following the two sold-out screenings of Nightbreed, the Cabal Cut on Sunday, Morgan Creek has given us permission to show the cut around the world and to raise money to prepare the cut for a release on Blu-ray. This could not, would not have happened without your voices. We have all been heard. The Morgan Creek team have my thanks and my respect. Very seldom does anyone in the movie business pay attention as they have, understanding perhaps that the message of the movie as I shot it is one that dramatizes a different ending to the age-old story of how a war between humankind and something other draws to a close. The real Nightbreed will be available for everyone to see. I hope its message of redemption and forgiveness move you. When I first heard this news, I was doing a happy dance all around my apartment. The Occupy Midian Facebook group was donning their celebratory hats once again and with good reason. But we must keep in mind that there is still quite a bit of work that must be done. Morgan Creek is giving permission to show the Cabal Cut worldwide, which will raise more awareness about this wonderful film. Also, they are giving permission to raise money for preparing the Cabal Cut for a Blu-ray release. This means there are still many things that need to be done to the film for it to be ready for release, as well as money that needs to be earned in order to put in this work. We are still waiting for further news from the wonderful folks that have been working so hard on Nightbreed the Cabal Cut on what measures they are going to take to raise funds and how we fans can help. So join us in the celebration and this huge step forward, but please help us continue to spread the word. Thank you to everyone who has worked so hard on helping to get the word out about this film. And for those of you who are able to attend, there is another screening coming up at the Portage Theater in Chicago on Friday, July 13th. For more information on the screening, please visit OccupyMidian.com slash screenings.html. Also, check there frequently to see if any more screenings have been added. To all those who have helped in any way, big or small, the tribes of the moon embrace you. Okay, so yeah, that was the Occupy Median report. Um, so that's really huge news. Uh, for any of you that didn't know already, um, now... Uh, now you know that there's uh, now it's okay to go ahead and raise money to to put the movie together. Yeah, that, that was great. You know that, that when I read that tweet uh, tweet from Clyde Barker, it, it was like you know I was I felt like the door is open for finally for the Cabal Cut to be uh, uh, reconstructed and and restored. I mean, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that that's a we've hit a pretty good halfway point at this point. Yes, we did. Those 5,000 signatures, which have now become 6,000 plus, have yeah. done the, the, the job of, you know, putting the foot in the door uh, and uh, just keep them coming, guys. Keep them coming. And um, that that uh, meeting with, I found out a little bit more about that meeting with um, with Morgan Creek. It was a phone call and an email. Uh, but what we don't know yet is whether they said anything about whether they would find the, you know, look for the footage, or if they're going to stick to saying that it, you know, they can't find it. Hmm. Yeah. Well, let's let's see what happens. Uh, I still think that there's still a little room for improvement uh, uh, in regards to this news, especially yeah. because I think that Morgan Creek is is probably still sounding the deeps 
you know, uh, they gave their blessing for this to circle, you know, around yeah. the world, like not just the U.S. and the U.K., but, you know, like places like Spain, uh, you know, Holland, uh, Italy, uh, I don't know, places that have been requesting Germany, places that have been requesting um, the Cabal Cut to go there to some sort of festival or film or film festival or convention. Yeah. But um, the good thing is that in every place that there will be a screening, there will be people finding out about the Cabal Cuts and about the website, about the petition. Well, and theoretically, <laughs> they, could, they could charge money and keep the money for the restoration now. Whereas before the screening, all the money from the screenings had to go to charity because that was Morgan Creek's movie and they didn't, you know, and we didn't want to make money off of it. Yeah, it was going towards scares that care. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next piece of news we have is uh, Gladiators vs. Zombies. Uh, Clive Barker is set to direct this. Um, this news sort of came out of nowhere for me because uh, Clive has said that he wouldn't be directing any more, any more uh, movies. So if he was to direct, we would have expected it would have been some Books of Blood story or sequel yeah. to something. Yeah, do you remember, um, I think that Clyde Barker said something like that uh, after the failed attempt at making a Tortured Souls movie. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then all the problems with trying to get Thief of Always made. Yes, and also the problems uh, regarding the Hellraiser remake mm -hmm. that he was supposed to produce, and he did like a, a treatment to to write a script for the remake of Hellraiser that, you know, God knows what happened to that. Although, you know, in one... In one one way I'm relieved that it, it wasn't done, but, you know. But, uh, yeah, so it, this really came out of nowhere. I've been looking at stuff from Gladiators and Zombies. I've found some animation videos about this. Um, like so I don't understand. Is this Was this an existing movie and this is a remake? Well, to be honest, I haven't really understood it myself. Um, I just did a quick search on Netflix because somebody had said it was. I had, somebody had said it was a remake, but I'd never heard of it before. Well, sure. I mean, that would be dependent on what Netflix has uh, on its catalog. Yeah, I mean, IMDb would be, would have been a better place to look, but I wanted to watch it. Yeah. Well, um, there is there are things uh, available on studios.amazon.com. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a script for Zombie vs. Gladiators called Michael's Original Draft on the website of Amazon Studios. And there are, like, trailers and, um, you know... Weird. There's trailers and, and videos and concept videos. I'll, I can, you know, add... I'll just send you this... I'll just send you this uh, right now. And that's the other strange thing, is that this is a partnership with Amazon.com, you know, their their movie studio. Yeah, I didn't even know they Amazon had Amazon.com is a movie studio. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this was the first we'd heard of that, too. Yeah. They're running out of movie studio now. <laughs> so, yeah, there are some rough cuts and test movies and test movie proposals and stuff like this. It's all available on the Amazon Studios website. Yeah. And there's even a little forum where they ask, like, uh, you know, is industry going insane? Uh, Clive Barker, there's a thread called Clive Barker, and says, let me guess, a comedy? I don't know what this is. So, I'm actually curious. Yeah, but it wouldn't be a comedy. I mean, the name is funny, but I, I it, you know, that's not his thing. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that, apparently there was a previous version of this movie, where I don't know if these are spoilers or not, but I'm going to say it anyway. Spoilers. Um, the zombies were all cured at the end by arrows dipped in tears. And uh, they all cure the zombies. Wow. A, yeah, it's, you know, I'm um, sorry if I spoil anything. I don't know if this version has anything to do with the one Clyde Barker's going to do. That, that had better not spoil anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have quite a reputation of spoiling movies for my friends. But um, this is what is going on on the Internet. I mean, there are these test videos and there are these, you know, I huh. uh, read about the idea for the uh, Zombie vs. Gladiators. I don't oh. know what, what Clive's going to make. And I'm really curious to find out how he's going to make it, it who's going to write it, and when is this going to be done. Yeah, well, I can't imagine that we would see anything until at least 2013. Mm hmm Yeah. Well, I got the 109-page script, so I'll look at it, and I'll send it to you after this is done. Oh, man. Okay. 
<laughs> it's on Amazon.com Studios. Wow. I mean, I don't even know why it's here, but it is here. And why, I'll yeah, why would they give out the script? <laughs> I don't know. It's on studios.amazon.com huh. slash script slash 3578. So that's Jeez. Eight. Yeah. Well, the other piece of news we have is that uh, Ken Cranham, who played Dr. Shenard in uh, Hellraiser 2 Hellbound, is going yeah. to be at the Hellraiser reunion at Monster Mania, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, August 17th. Great. That, that the gang's all there. Yeah, so obviously there's enough people that were in Nightbreed there that uh, I would say that a, a, a screening of, of uh, the, the Cabal Cut of Nightbreed is a no-brainer. Uh, they don't even need Morgan's Creek's permission anymore now. They just need uh, they just need to organize it with the the hosts. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. That sounds amazing. And uh, and Bobby is going to be there. Yeah, of course, and Bobby. She was very happy about the uh, the information that uh, Morgan Creek has allowed the screenings to go worldwide and gather the money for the restoration. She. She posted about it. She was ecstatic. Yeah, and and Matt, you know who Ann Bobby is, right? Uh, I. She, she was no. she was uh, she was Lori in in uh, Nightbreed. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So she um she actually came up with uh, the name Occupy Midian when I was interviewing her in in uh, at the first screening of the Cabal Cut. Oh, okay. It was funny. Craig Sheffer, who was Boone. Uh, Said, yeah, man. If they don't let you know, if they don't put this movie on on DVD or Blu-ray, they're gonna be they're gonna occupy uh, Morgan Creek. And then she said, "Occupy Midian," and we just sort of ran with it. <laughs> yes, excellent. So she's been a pretty big help, um, you know, and she's been pretty active on the Facebook group and stuff too. Lending it legitimacy is like, like you know, look, we've got. You know, people involved with the movie, you know, yeah. stars are now. Are, well, and, are, are, and, the, are, are, and Clive Barker is behind it also. Yeah. So that's been how, pretty how much, good. How much, uh, how much footage, like like new footage? 55 minutes or 40, 48, something like that. Do you remember, Jose? Yeah, it's, um, they they have, um, the movie has, has become, from 100 minutes, it's gone up to 155 minutes. So. Okay. Wow, that's <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, the, the the reviews that have been coming out now, they have been uh, all pretty much unanimous on touching one little thing, which is they think that the Cabal Cut is great to see all the new footage, but they're wondering um, if this is going to be the real final director's cut, and yeah. they all they all complain a little bit about pacing and uh, that it's too long. That it's too long and some parts go on for a long time. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah, I mean, it was hard to think of it that way because I was studying it the whole time when I was watching it. You know, I was I was pretty absorbed in it. If you're already a fan, you're like, well, I've I, I've seen the movie several times and now I want to see all this new stuff. So you're yeah. not really thinking of Absolutely. it as a movie. Yeah, yeah, and and it is it is really really a different movie. Mm -hmm. um, I liked it a lot better. Yeah, so, you know, I trust you. <laughs> I want to see it, too. Um, you know, hopefully I'll see it at a, at a screening, because that's another thing. A lot of people have been going on, hey, how can I see this movie? How can I, you know, can I download this movie? And it's like, no, you can't, because yeah. uh, that would destroy our chances of getting it, you know, finally released in Blu-ray and DVD. Yeah, if that uh, started uh, circulating around the Internet, then can you imagine what, what Morgan Creek would do? Yeah. So just to make this clear, this is not a fan cut. This is not a fan edit. This is something being done with Clyde Barker, with Russell Charrington, Mark Miller from Seraphim. And it's a, it's a film that, um, you know, uh, if everything goes well, I mean, it can go either of two ways. We can yeah. either get the, the Cabal cut restored from the work by DHS, which would still be, you know, if, if there's no other alternative, I would be happy with that because there have been movies which, which have had like director's cuts done, uh, sourced from VHS. Yeah, um, the the um, um, Alien Three, right? The, right? I mean, the, you can buy the, the the set of where you get the theatrical cut on one disc, and then the completely different movie with all the work print footage in it on on a second disc. Sure. Yeah, that that's one fine example, and. And the other, the other uh, alternative is that, you know, Morgan Creek finally says, okay, 
movie's been screening. There's been a really good reception to it. And you guys raised some money. I think we're going to also, you know, look for the film and try to make, uh, you know, a restored edition. That would be, that would be my dream. Yeah. And that's what I, I have, you know, I, I might not be a very religious person, but I have faith that this might happen. And uh, it's, you know, that, that can, if that happens, then I'm sure that we'll have a Blu-ray with the restored director's cut and, and a lot of and Russell has said that you know his his vision would be something like what they did with Blade Runner is just to have everything. Oh yeah, can you imagine a set that would have a theatrical cut, like the work print untouched, then like the extended Cabal cut, and then yeah. finally the final director's cut with you know a few trims here and there for pacing. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. You know, and, and along with Revelation's book on the production of Nightbreed, that would yeah. rock. And then they could throw in, then they could throw in the cassette of the video game. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, that kind of leads us in. That was a terrible segue, but that leads us into our main, uh, our first main topic, which is uh, Clive Barker and video games. Uh, yeah. So the first one we could talk about is Nightbreed, the action game by Ocean in 1990, and that was on Amiga. Amstrad, CPC, Atari ST, Commodore 64, uh, ZX, Spectrum, and PC. I, I had the, uh, the Atari ST version. Uh, so that, yeah, that was the one where you're running around with Boone punching people, right? Yes. Yeah, so that that game actually, I didn't, I, 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 know, I knew I had played that before, and I must have played it at your house. Yeah, I, 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 I think technically I didn't own it. A friend of mine owned it, but um, but we were we were always trading games back and forth. But yeah, we, I think between between me and a couple of friends, I think we had both Nightbreed games. I, I had the other one. Okay, yeah, maybe yeah. maybe maybe you were the one that, that had that had a copy that I was playing at the that that was the adventure game. Yeah, yeah. So this one, um, you run around and you punch uh, the cops, and then you get into Midian, and then you're dodging Nightbreed and. You're going through doorways, and every every area looks the same, and you get lost. That's what I remember: is getting lost in Midian and getting angry. Is that the game that had that like shark-like flying creature that would you know show up in some tunnels and you have to jump up and down and duck? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so there were two games for Nightbreed. What, what was it? I have one. Yeah. Which I saw. It's from Ocean. It's called uh, Nightbreed: The Action Game. Yeah, I that's think. the one we're talking about. I have yeah, that in two and, and then uh, the sequel they made, they were going to make a trilogy of these games, and the sequel they made was called Nightbreed, the Interactive Movie, and mm -hmm. that's the one with all the, you know, the, the horrible cutscenes that were like art, you know, 256 color art. Oh, okay. And, huh. you know, really long loading times, and then you're, there's the scene, there's this part where you're driving up the, the road, and you get a flat tire, and or you get caught by the police, and I made it as far as when you're running away from Peliquin, and oh, yes. they, and they would show they would show a view over your shoulder, and you're like jerking the joystick back and forth, trying to make his legs move so you can run away from Peliquin. And oh. I could never do it, and I would always get killed by Peliquin, and I, and I think I I threw the game away. Wasn't that like, <laughs> like a really at field. the beginning? What's that? Wasn't that really at the beginning of the game? <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. What a disappointment it must have been for you. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and it was another thing about it. It was an obvious port. I mean, even though the, the Amiga version, I think, was the only version of that game, uh, but it was obviously ported from something else like they had intended it to be PC because the Amiga could support 4,096 colors, and PCs at the time were only like 256. Oh yeah, no, the, the, yeah, the Amiga version was not the native version of that. No. Yeah, uh, uh, there's, there's, a, yeah, there's an Atari ST version of that one too. Oh, is there really? Played. Yeah. And I, I distinctly remember um, uh, uh, Duggar sliding down the screen when, when you're about to be shot. <laughs> yeah. so they just took the image and slide him down. Like, do, 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 do. I was off the screen, and now you're dead. <laughs> yeah. We'll have I'm trying to find it on YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to put some YouTube videos on oh, the... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a ton uh, of, of videos of both of those games. Yeah. Nightbreed, the interactive movie. There it is. There's the yeah. map. Yeah, Yeah, that's, and, that's, that's, and that's... well, and that's the other thing. It wasn't a whole lot like the movie because it was all it was all sort of 
rated G and and uh, you know and and shortened up. Yeah, yeah. And wasn't there one of those games that ended before you? Uh, I mean, uh, one of those games was not the complete story of of Nightbreed, right? It was yeah. like you got to Midian or something, and then the game would end. I think, yeah, I think the interactive movie was actually the first one, and then the action game maybe came later. Okay. The information yeah. on the internet about it is sketchy because they were both made in 1990, but. Right. Well, when I got my version of the action game, uh, I already did not own a um, Sinclair computer anymore. So I, I just have the, the, the tape in the game. Yeah, the box. And I'd, I've never played that game. I just saw the walkthrough on YouTube. And, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you pretty pain- much played it if you've seen the walkthrough. <laughs> <laughs> it's really painful even to watch. Yeah. <laughs> and there's one of those games, I think it must be the uh, the the interactive movie, that has those cutscenes with, like, Boom going to the psychiatrist. Yes. And, 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 yep, yeah, yep. and really, really truncated dialogue. It's like, you killed these people, Boom. No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, you did. We're moving on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> turn, turn away from the roadblock. Nope, I'm going to crash to the roadblock. All right. <laughs> yeah, and there was one part where you could run out of fuel before you haven't even got to Midian, which was, you know, ridiculous. Yeah, it's and like... then the game's over. <laughs> <laughs> That's point. You ran out of gas and you're dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that was the whole point. Why Why would they put, you know, us running out of gas before we got to Midian? Ugh. <laughs> yeah, That's so so faithful to the movie. <laughs> Yeah. You remember? Don't, you don't remember that scene when Boone ran out of gas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just when he ate that bad sandwich at the diner on the road, and then he had to stop uh, in the freeway. Yeah. Anyway. Oh man. Okay. So, so the next one. Um, this is a movie, a game that never happened, uh, but there was a Hellraiser game by a company called Color Dreams that was yeah. made for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Mm-hmm. In 1990, really? yeah, and this is crazy, but these guys bought the rights to make a, a Hellraiser video game. They spent a lot of money on that. Uh, then they realized that their game was too, you know, the, the NES wasn't powerful enough to put yeah. their Hellraiser game on there, so they designed a super cartridge Oh okay. wow. to put the NES game on, and then, uh, then, it, then it fell apart after that. Oh, okay. The, the Super Cartridge was a Z80-based system that intercepted the NES processor's ROM and RAM access to manipulate video in real time. Mm. Uh, oh, okay. It, uh, one of those, yes. Yeah. It seems to me like this This would be a very, very expensive game to buy. And they spent around 35000 to $50,000 to buy the rights for the Hellraiser <laughs> yeah. game. And, you know, of course... Uh, you know, they 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 didn't they didn't uh, they didn't get to finish the game. So yeah, uh, yeah, and and well, and it, what's crazy to me is if if it's that powerful and that you know in 1990, why didn't they put it on something else? I mean, they could have done it on the Genesis, uh, or you know, or Mega Drive in Europe, or they could have put it on PC or something. Yeah, yeah, that, that could have been done, but you know, so basically. Um, they they tried doing that uh, super cartridge, but if no one would buy the game, yeah, uh, there was really no point in finishing the Hellraiser game. Well, and, and and it seems like the the Nintendo isn't the Nintendo. What probably wasn't the best venue for a horror game. Yeah, yeah, especially like a uh, yeah something something like Hellraiser. You, you, like the uh, the Nintendo's base was like mostly younger kids then, and then like yeah. the, the Genesis was where like you. But it was considered the adult system, and right, right when it came out. Yeah, yeah, more about arcade ports and stuff. Right, and uh, from what I've learned, then the guys from Color Dreams uh, discovered that they could earn a good amount of money if, if you know, to the if they sold games to the Christian market. So uh, I don't know how Elraiser would have fitted with that <laughs> the market. <laughs> uh, yeah, someone tells me that would be uh, yeah. <laughs> wouldn't be stocked at the uh, the Christian Supply House. Yeah, and then so then right after that, uh, there was a Candyman game uh, th- that oh. was designed for S- for Sega in '91, uh, oh. presumably for the Genesis, but it never uh, it never materialized. 
I did not know that. Wow. And then after that, Colored Dreams uh, changed their Hellraiser game to be on the on the Wolfenstein engine. Oh yeah, that would have been great. And They'll... yeah, and they they were they had that they had um, they had done quite a bit of work on that, and then Doom came out and sort of like they're like, oh god, you know, now what <laughs> yeah. do we do? And th- these guys, um, these guys were the same guys who did Bible games. Uh, again, they were going. <laughs> yeah. And the Bible games for the NES had this game called Noah's Ark 3D. <laughs> Basically, it was using the, the 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 Wolfenstein 3D engine. And what you did was you had you were Noah, and you had to <laughs> capture <laughs> animals to bring back to the ark. I'm not kidding. This, this thing is real. You can find it on YouTube. So is that is that only in Europe? Uh, no, this was in America. Really, I uh, never never heard of that. I've I've, yeah. heard, I've heard of the Noah's Ark game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do a Hellraiser <laughs> mashup with that. And you're Noah, and uh, you found this interesting box. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, and basically what Noah did was he went around shooting uh, uh, sleeping pills with a slingshot and putting sheep to sleep. <laughs> I totally remember that. <laughs> Absolutely true. I'm not making it up. I swear to God, it, it's on the, it's on YouTube. And uh, instead of like being like you know the Wolfenstein 3D guy shooting Nazis, it was Noah with a slingshot shooting pills <laughs> at sheep. So I, I I wonder how would it how would it have worked for the Hellraiser game? There are images of the sprites that they were going to use. Yeah. So uh, you know it, it would have been fun to see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like you said, like Doom came out, and it, you know, it, Doom was like light years away. Yeah, from, way, way ahead of Castle, Castle Wolfenstein. Yeah, so they couldn't really justify releasing the game anymore. But that would have been great. You know? And then after that, uh, Konami had bought, I think, bought the rights to the Hellraiser game from uh, from Color Dreams. Mm-hmm. And so they developed a game that would have been for PlayStation, Super Nintendo, and NAX PC 9801, whatever that is. And the Super Famicom, which was only available in Japan. Yeah, that's just, that's the that's the uh, yeah, it's the same thing as the Super Nintendo in in uh, the U.S. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that, that Konami pitched that, and it was turned down. Well. Um... Apparently, the game wasn't picked up because, according to the developer, Konami pitched the game, and the Hellraiser people didn't bite or they wanted too much money. So the developers, you know, a small attempt was made to change the name uh, of the game to avoid a lawsuit, but the whole project ended up being scrapped. Um, And, you know, so as legend goes, it was slated for the Japanese PC, probably the 9801 series, and as a Super Mm -hmm. Famicom title. Because, yeah. you know, Hellraiser was big in Japan, wasn't it? I mean, they loved Hellraiser in Japan, especially Hellraiser 2. Mm. Uh, I mean, I got, I got uh, Japanese programs for Hellraiser movies, and, you know, they were pretty fancy. Um, especially because, you know, Julia was a real villain in, in Hellbound. Yeah. And in Japan, that was really scary for them to see, like, women, like, killing men in, in movies. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, wow, what's this? So, you know. And you know, and then um, there was that other game that most people know about, which was Virtual Hell. Yeah, Hellraiser <laughs> Virtual Hell, and that was on the Duke Nukem 3D engine. Yeah, I don't remember Virtual Hell at all. <laughs> well, it didn't come out either. Oh, okay. But it, but it was the, probably the. We're, we're, we're still, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're still talking about a, a dead project. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we're doing these in chronological order, but yeah, Hellraiser Virtual Hell. Uh, was in 1996, and they. This is probably the one that they got the farthest in development. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember seeing <clears throat> concept art for this, and um, I remember a particular scene, which would be uh, Pinhead reaching out from a screen and grabbing the player and pulling him into the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that hey, would have been. Oh, hurry, video drum. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. That, um, and there's a quote from Doug Bradley. He said, uh, you know, when in, 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 during an interview, he said, I say things to the player like, I'm delighted they've fallen for a trap I've laid, or issue a warning not to get too carried away after they're slightly successful. I'd like to see the finished product so I could understand why I was doing a weird bit 
that at the time seemed so ridiculous. Yeah. So um, he did some voice acting already for it too, and yeah, voice acting, and you know, he got into the makeup because they had to do, like digitize him and, and photograph him for uh, that. So it, it would have been it would have been fun to see. I've got I've seen like a rare um, concept art of this as well, where you would go through the tunnels, you would find like things like a huge spider or you know the engineer, and uh, you'd have to solve puzzles and stuff like that. Who knows? It might have been fun. I just saw the concept art sketchboards. So who knows what it might have been? And and the Duke Nukem 3D's engine, it would have been great. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that that's funny. You know, the way that the way the video games are now, something like that could be a downloadable title. Oh you yeah. Know, if they ever yeah. wanted to finish it. Okay. You could probably. I don't know. Like like the. the, the the property is so strong still that I, I think you can make it a, a modern AAA game and have it actually. I mean, it'd have to be a big game. But, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I, that property is still, you know, <laughs> it will still grab people if there was like a modern Xbox game for it. But. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. You know, it's funny how many attempts have been made to make a Hellraiser game that have failed. And it, it, it would have had people starting off the game by. Uh, uh, opening up an element configuration in virtual reality. And, you know, so uh, there, there are pictures. There are pictures of, you know, Doug Bradley and pins and pictures of the development team to record his, his scenes and all that stuff. Maybe we can uh, link back to this um, list of vaporware from uh, the Hellbound Web, which yeah. they have a good thorough uh, catalog of games that were made and not made. <laughs> yeah. Oh, all the Hellraiser ones, anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. And, yeah. So that, it was it was a pretty pretty cool. Oh, here is the picture of the guy Pinhead coming out of the. Uh, I'm looking at it right now the picture of Pinhead stretching out of the screen and and threatening to you know bring into the computer someone who looks ex- a bit like Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> You're on a computer, so you have to be a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's still uh, it's still the nineties, right? Yeah. It's like holy crap, computers weird. Yeah, this was ninety six. This was in ninety six. Yeah. So uh, after the, after they were like, you know, we're out of the we're out of the eighties where they were just like you know bizarre and people were terrified of them. You know, now now it's you know, ooh, ner- nerds get paid to use these things, right? <laughs> And that was a time where the uh, the games were developing and, and evolving really, really quickly. So if you spend too much time planning a, a certain a certain game, I mean, the engines could, you know, the next big thing could come out and you'd be left at, you know, outside in the rain. So I guess that's what happened to these games when they were starting to try to use the Wolfenstein 3D engine, the real D3D, 3D Realms, um, the 3D Realms, engine and the doom engine and all that stuff and it's just it was just a time when these things were evolving really quickly so yeah it's hard for it was hard for a smaller it was getting tough for a smaller team to to be able to do something fast enough yeah it's amazing the amount of money they had to spend to to make these these games i mean just to buy the rights and everything it was quite a quite an investment so what what came next uh oh okay so this is another another one that was scrapped uh ectosphere (laughs) What didn't come next? Yeah. So what didn't come next was Ectosphere, uh, which was based on the the comic Ecto Kid. Oh yeah, great. Yeah, and I love that one. I don't. I couldn't find any more information about like when this was supposed to happen. It may have been only an idea. I mean, maybe I don't know how much of anything. Oh, I like the Google. game industry. People announce stuff before any work has been done. Yeah. Yeah, Ectosphere. It might have been cool. You do you know anything about Ecto Kid? The, the comic book? Uh, I know it exists. <laughs> I don't know yeah. anything about it. Well, the thing about Ecto Kid, I was big on Ecto Kid. I even have like a, a drawing of Ecto Kid done by you know the, the artist that made the first few issues. Dex and, Mungo. Uh, the, the, the Dave Scrooge. Oh, um, no, I mean uh, that's the main character. Oh right, yeah. Um, so that guy, he was his dad was a ghost. His mother was a human. So he would be someone who would be on the fence between the world of the living and the world of the dead or, you know, the ectosphere. 
so he uses um, an eye patch, and if he switches the eye patch to a, the other eye, he can see the, the world of the dead. And if he switched the eye patch back to the other eye, then he would see our world. So that was kind of a neat concept that you could like switch between you know one one world and the other. Um, yeah, that that might have been a cool concept for a game. I don't know. I, I never heard of Ectosphere. Yeah. Well, the the next um, and that was uh, that was that was based on the comic from um, Clive. Clive did a whole bunch of comics all at once uh, for Marvel. Um, the uh, Razor line, Razor comic. line, yeah, yeah. And at the time, I bought number one of each one, but then when they weren't being written by Clive Barker, I sort of stopped buying them. Uh, but but lately, I've collected them all. I haven't read them all yet. Yeah, we should talk about them in an upcoming episode. Oh, definitely, yeah. But I have all of them. You know, I have all of the Saint Sinner, Acto Kid, Hokum and X, uh, and Hyperkind. Hyperkind. Hyperkind was like Clive Barker's. Superheroes. It was like X Men. Yeah, it was like yeah. an X Men kind of thing. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Did he do well, like his own imprint, like like a horror imprint for Marvel? Uh, it was the Razor Line imprint, I think. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I found some more information on the Ectosphere video game. It was supposed to be done from Virgin Games, and it will be designed by Clive himself. Oh. Uh, okay. Yeah. And uh, I'm just trying to open up the uh, the page here. Well, we can come back to this later. So, uh, what is next? Next one is Clive Barker's Undying, and this one actually happened. It was in 2002 for PC uh, by DreamWorks Interactive, and then or 2001 for PC uh, by DreamWorks Interactive, and 2002 uh, for the Mac by Westlake Interactive. And you know, I've been a Mac person for ever since you know my Amiga became obsolete. So for me, you know, having a Mac version was a huge deal. Uh, yeah. And uh, I play this game. I actually play this game, and I have it. So it's pretty cool. I Me never too. finished it, though. I, I yeah, see, I, I, I played with it, but I was also uh, uh, I was playing a lot of games at the time. And uh, yeah, but we, we we had it, and I fiddled with it, but I didn't beat it. I beat it. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of there's a lot. I mean, you basically just have to save your game a lot uh, because it's really difficult, especially oh, towards the end. A, a big slog. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remember you I, I, played some guy with a beard and long hair and like an amulet. Yeah, and you, Patrick you, Galloway. You would visit your friend who was about to die or something, yeah. and he was living in a house with his family, and he was saying that there was some kind of like dark curse going on with his family since they'd done some ritual in an island a long yeah, time ago. Yeah, on Standing Stones. <laughs> right. Yeah, so it begins in 1923 after World War I. Veteran Patrick Galloway receives an urgent letter from his friend Jeremiah Covenant. And one interesting thing is, is Jeremiah Covenant was voiced by Clive Barker. Oh, was he? Yeah. Huh. Wow, I, I, I didn't know that. Wow. Pretty cool. And, yeah. And Galloway had had kind of a supernatural experience in World War One and... And Covenant was his friend and sort of, you know, had known him as someone who'd had this supernatural experience. And I think that's why he called him when they were having this problem. So anyway, he's like, he's sort of bedridden ridden and, and in poor health. And his his family are like these sort of ghosts that are haunting him. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that, that sticks to my mind from playing this game was... Um, the house was great. The house, the whole, the whole environment of the yeah. game was, was amazing. I mean, great, you know, the, the house is full of tapestries and detail and furniture. And mm -hmm. uh, just the people in the house, they didn't really behave in a very realistic way because you were, like, finding werewolves in the kitchen. And then there's, like, the cook that's just, you know, standing right there looking at you. And afterwards, you can go talk to her. And she never, looked like, oh, 
Yeah, and she goes like... All, all oh. first-person shooter games are like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. an uh, Unreal Engine, I think. Yeah. And she would go like, oh, heavens, are you okay? Uh, well, i got to <laughs> get back to work. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Not my problem. <laughs> I, I just You're on your own. <laughs> He's like, shoo, shoo, get out of my kitchen, werewolf. I'm trying to cook. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like, yeah, was on the table. Um, <laughs> That was fun. That was fun. Like there was a butler and the maid and the the cook and you know you're going around the house shooting you know like you know like your Yosemite Sam or something. Yeah. <laughs> like whatever. Yeah, and it, it was it was a really uh, I mean because it was on the Unreal Engine it was a pretty realistic kind of a cool game at the time it, it you know you'd shoot the if you shoot and you miss you'd see a little bullet hole in the wall. I mean it wouldn't mm-hmm. stay there the whole time, but. Yeah, and I, could you see like footprints as well? I yeah. think I yeah. footprints or something. So yeah, and there was also something that you could do because uh, Pat, Patrick Galloway, mm-hmm. he had this uh, amulet or something, and he could do something called scry or scree or oh, whatever. Oh, and then that would show you secret things in the. Oh, show you secret things in the game, yeah. and uh, I was just reading just to get back to the one we were talking before, the Ecto Street game, mm-hmm. and. Uh, they, there was supposed to be, uh, I'm reading here on Revelations, there was supposed to be an ability on, on the game that would be similar to the one, the Scry ability in, in Undying, and you would be able to see the, um, the, the Ghost World. So just, uh, you know, just to tell you about the Ecto Street game a little more. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, and it, one of my favorite parts of this game was towards the end, you got a gun called the Tibetan War Cannon. Mm-hmm. And it was this, it looked like you were holding really? this, this huge log and it had a lion head on the end and it would shoot fireballs. At, yeah, it, and it would shoot fireballs at your enemies. It's a super I remember that. We need the giant, like, over, over, rotten nightmare gun. Yes. I remember that. That was like Five's version of the BFG. <laughs> yeah. Tibetan war cannon. Yeah. Tibetan war cannon, wow. Yeah. So that, yeah. that was pretty cool. And I, I liked this game a lot. I think I probably played through it two or three times at the time that it came out. Um, and it still, I think it still works on Mac OS X. I think. Hmm. Well, for example, for PC, you can play any game as long as you've got something called DOSBox. Right, right. Yeah, and it's it's tricky with Macs because when they switched from OS 9 to OS 10, it was like a complete start over. Yeah, it's called GX underpinnings now. Yeah, and so, but but this was in two thousand and two, so it may have been that I think that was right when Mac OS ten started. Yeah, but but then also they've also abandoned all the architecture that supported um, PowerPC chips, and and uh, now they can pretty much only run software that works on Intel chips. Mm-hmm. So I'm dying. Uh, basically. What was it about the ending of the game? I mean, I know that that guy was dying, his friend was dying, and his family was, like, turning against their own brother. Yeah, and, at one and point, his family were all sort of uh, undead, and I, maybe that's where the undying word name comes from. Right, so they had all for- forfeited their souls or something when they did some kind of ritual on standing yeah. stones when they were kids, right? And then they came back to haunt them. So there were some pretty cool monsters in that yeah. game. That was- there was the werewolves at the beginning, and then there were other creatures that, you know, it's hard to describe. There, there were some kind of Lovecraftian Cthulhu-looking uh, monsters that came, you know, that sort of floated in at you towards the end, too. Yeah, and I remember some pretty cool-looking uh, rooms in the house. There was, like, a library with paintings, and um, that, that was pretty cool. You, you, you would see, like, this ghost floating around looking for, for books. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, remember that? Uh, yeah. that was pretty cool. And there was also a big chapel, like a kind of that almost looked like a, a small cathedral. I don't know where you would find another um, magic stone, and and uh, and you did at the end. You went into a different dimension, didn't you? Yes. Because I I remember playing a part where you were finding this ghost, and it was in um like an alternative dimension where you had to jump from stone to stone to get to this circle or something eh? yeah yeah and there was like just an abyss ben- beneath you yeah and it was a really cool game i really enjoyed that game i didn't i never finished it 
That was because, really close to the end, if you were there. Uh, yeah, well, I kind of cheated a little bit on the game, so I, w- I would play some parts of it without actually getting there. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I was playing Jericho at the time, and, oh. and the difference between the graphics and the gameplay of Jericho and Undying, yeah. you know, that, that's made, pretty Jer- made the Undying seem a little... <laughs> Too primitive for me, so I never really got to finish it. Yeah. The end of days will soon be upon us. What is thy bidding? I have summoned you to wreak vengeance. There will be no escape for the innocent. Kill all of them. No forgiveness for the guilty. And I want them to suffer. And no mercy shown to mankind. Make them suffer. Our next one was Clive Barker's Demonic. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this one, when I saw a trailer for it, um, I watched every single day on on. Um, I, I had a, a bookmark for on the Xbox website. Yeah. You know, every single day checking to see when that was going to come out. I bought an Xbox 360 for this game. Oh no! Yeah. And that didn't come out. Yeah, and then and then it got scrapped. Um, you can see footage of the game there. Well, there's a trailer. Uh, and and it's kind of like you're a, you're this predatory looking demon, and uh, this woman summons you and she wants you to go around and kill all these people that she doesn't like. And I think that the concept was that the more people you kill, the more powerful you get. Until by the end, you should be able to break out of the spell and kill this lady that summoned you. Oh, really? <clears throat> okay. the, the, um, the 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 story was you would assume the role of a demonic creature named Volrath who was summoned to Earth by people who are desperately seeking revenge against those who have done them wrong. So our mission would be to exact revenge on behalf of, of the person that summoned us, which was a, a woman. In the trailer, you can see you can see her saying, go ahead and avenge those who destroy my life or something. And um, so our, our job there was murder those people. So uh, Volrath also was able to uh, disguise himself, I think. He didn't always go around in demonic form. He, he um, would possess people and then yeah. would use their body to, to sneak around and stuff. Right, right. So, yeah, that was it. And uh, so we would have to go around looking for a host. And, you know. uh, yeah. and, and actually, Justin Calvert, who was a guy who worked for, um, I think it, uh, he was, he, he said this about the game, that one of the most powerful characters you could potentially control uh, in the game would be a priest, whereas a criminal wouldn't be very strong at all. Um, different characters would have different abilities when you possess them, such as security guards being armed with a pistol. The only characters that you won't be able to possess in demonic are D-Man, who <coughs> during our meeting, but would carry equipment that makes them immune to demonic possession. Uh, now, I, don't know, I don't know who these D-Man would be, yeah. but... It seemed like there was a, a really well constructed story and world, and all the stuff was in place to make the game. And then, ah, uh, why was it canceled? Um, the cancelled was the cancel was because of the financial straits of Majesco, the backing publisher. Yeah. Um, and they the, the, they had originally pu- partnered with Tiger Hill Entertainment, which was John John Woo. Yeah. And. Uh, and for and for a while it was worked on for Sega, mm-hmm. and they turned it down. And and this game was supposed to go on <clears throat> on the Xbox three three sixty, right? Yeah, it was originally going to be for all the the all of the uh, next generation consoles, but then then it became an Xbox three sixty exclusive. Yeah, I wonder who who has this you know this property. I mean, I'm sure that the game. <laughs> The game must have been partially finished. I mean, or even finished at all. Uh, 
I, you know, I know that sometimes, you know, it takes a while for them to get the game completed. And oftentimes, uh, you know, on E3, they'll just show like stuff that's just trailers and sometimes yeah. they're not even gameplay. But uh, I would really like to know who has this and, you know, some guy out there has this in his computer, you know. And yeah, you can see a whole bunch of footage of the game in a movie called Grandma's Boy. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because the, the main character is a game tester who's secretly working on his own game in his spare time. And oh. uh, that's the game that he's working on that, like, blows everybody away at the end of the oh, movie. Wow. Oh, now I need to find that, that movie. Grandma's Boy, you said? Yeah, Grandma's Boy. Okay, all right, that's pretty cool. I, I had I didn't know that. That that that's amazing. Yeah, yeah it's but, not a it's not a great movie, but you know you can see that that game there. I remember um, finding on the internet by the time of demonic was being you know announced and everything. I found something which was like this Japanese video on a website, and I downloaded it, and it was like a really long, like a twenty minute long video of Clive Barker sitting on a chair talking about demonic. Mm. And show bits and pieces of the game. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what happened to that. I know I downloaded it and put it somewhere. It might be in the CD-ROM or something. Oh. If I find that out, you know, I'll be sure to put that on YouTube or something. Because it was a really cool, cool thing. He was talking about creating worlds and universes. You know, he was like, hey, my name is Clyde Barker and I create universes. And That's it was cool. a really cool video. So I need to find out where I put that thing because I know there are there are trailers for Demonic, but I still remember that video. I think I have it somewhere. Oh well, I know what it was. Clive, Clive had said that uh, at some point that they were also planning to make a movie uh, based on Demonic. Oh yeah, was that when John Woo would be in, involved? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe so. Okay. But I, right. I mean, but it would have been you know based on the success of the game. So. Right. Yeah, uh, the, the artwork was really cool. I mean, there was there was artwork for the box and everything. It was this demon with, you know, uh, the horns that looked like Princess Leia buns. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it was like demonic with a pentagram. And, you know, I, I have the cover, so I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, and I've got a link to the trailer. You can still find it on GameSpot. Oh, okay, great. Uh, so the next one was Clive Barker's Jericho uh, in 2007 by Codemasters, and it was on PC, Xbox 360, and PS3. I'm pretty sure that was pretty much a simultaneous release on all three of those. Mm -hmm. uh, I got my copy signed during the Mr. Be Gone uh, book signing, so I think it was right about the same time that Mr. Be Gone came out. Sweet. Yeah, Jericho was a, was a great game. I mean, yeah. I think it still manages to have really good graphics to this day, even though it's a few years old. Yeah. And uh, I, I played it through the end. There were a few parts where the gameplay was a little um, confusing. Yeah. It, got, it, it dragged on for a long time, especially the scenes where you were like killing the same enemies over and over again they kept respawning and it would go on for like 15 minutes and you'd be like oh finally i've killed the last guy now i can move on to the next yeah uh, yeah well and also i think that it would have been more successful if it had been cooperative because you've got this team of four people that are always like running around behind you so people sort of expected that they would be able to play online as you know different members of the team together Okay, yeah, sure, I see that. But the whole point here was you would have to be able to take possession of each member team to do specific tasks. Yeah. So that's another challenge in the game is you have to go around because one, your, your character gets killed in the beginning of the game. Uh, there's this giant winged creature that swoops down, picks you up, slashes you up, drops you from a big height, and you die with your team around you. And then... You, uh, you and then the next level is called I'm still here, which is when you discover that you can take possession of your team members, and uh, you know you just go around hopping from player to player, which is pretty useful sometimes. I mean, sometimes you just need to do something that has to be done by a certain character with a certain ability, so you can just hop into that guy and you know use his ability to open a gate or something. Yeah, so that that was cool. That was cool. 
Um, the yeah, team I, I played through it uh, three times actually on every difficulty level, so I could get all the achievements. Oh, cool! Huh. I don't remember. I don't think there were achievements in uh, the PC game. So. Oh yeah, yeah. I just played it on the Xbox 360, and recently I bought the PlayStation 3 one. And I started to play it a little bit, and then it's like, wow, I'm really... How did I get bad at this game again? <laughs> well, I... I don't, or lose it. <laughs> yeah. I don't like playing shoot 'em up games with a controller. I'm more used to the uh, keyboard and mouse thing. Oh, so yeah. I would just go around hitting walls and, you know, looking at the sky. So, you know Ryan since he was a kid? Yeah. Well, since, since we were teenagers, um, uh, we... We didn't go to high school together so much as, like, pretty much all of my friends okay, in high school. I guess, like, I guess not. Oh, yeah, we spent, spent a lot of time tinkering on Amigas and making making silly movies. <laughs> that I still have yeah. my Did you also uh, work on his Emmett the Crab movies? I worked on I worked on the the, the, the I was I was in the Kung Fu movies that he did. <laughs> our, uh, our, uh, our, our our yeah, Jose doesn't know about those. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> that's one. Bone secret chance. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of lots of gaming. Lots of uh, lots of late night doodling and. Yeah. I don't know what else do we do. We we uh, yeah lot, we watched a lot of movies. Yeah, a lot of lot of a uh, lot of horror movies. We played Dungeons um, and Dragons. Yes. I that old time. I just started playing the Wii because I bought my girlfriend a Wii um, for Valentine's Day, <clears throat> uh, along with the uh, uh, Guitar Hero Masters of Rock or something uh, game. And uh, I just created this guitar player called Cabal. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. So, but I'm terrible at Guitar Hero. I, you know, I, I, I go like 50% on those music, and it's like even on the slowest setting, it's, I need to practice on the. I also have like a Super Mario, Super Mario Brothers for the Wii. Mm. I can't make it past the first level. It's like, oh wow, this is really <laughs> oh, hard. Yeah, I keep running into Goombas and stuff like that. Wow, so it's harder than the old game. I don't know. I, I think it's just me not being used to playing with a controller because I never had a console except for the PlayStation Two, which oh, I ended really? up. Yeah, I ended up giving it to my nephew. So I. I I didn't really. I never really had much of an experience with with consoles. I'm more of a PC gamer myself, mm. so I I, I played. Sort of a... Yeah, I, I played Wolfenstein 3D. I played, you know, uh, Spear of Destiny, Doom, Doom 2, Quake, uh, Call of Duty, whatever, Jericho. So those were the games that you know I, I prefer to play. Yeah, I grew up with computers, sort of pre PC. Like I didn't. I didn't have an actual like IBM. PC machine until high school, like before it was always like, you know, Ataris mm. and Amigas and stuff, so I yeah, grew I had, up with I those. Yeah, I the Amiga, too. All right. So you guys want to get back to Jericho? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we didn't really talk about what it's about, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Jericho was the, um, that, that was the next generation one. Was that PS2 or PS3? Three. PS3, Xbox 360, PC. All right, so yeah, so that was this. <laughs> this iteration of yeah, of, uh, and it, of, it was by Codemasters in 2007. Uh, ah. So it was like there's this um, there's this sort of team of, of these sort of mercenaries that that have these superpowers. Yeah, and um, they're sent to investigate the the Ru Rubal Kali, which is like the they call it the Empty Quarter. Yeah, the Department of Occult War Warfare um, had been created in the 30s, <clears throat> combat the supernatural. And what, what they say in the first uh, few minutes of gaming is that, you know, in the old days, uh, the church would burn us. Now they use us to fight their wars. So these, these guys have all, you know, they're, they're like witches with guns. Mm -hmm. and, and the interesting thing uh, in the plot of this game is that uh, God, uh, the first person that God made was called the Firstborn, and he was kind of a screw-up. And God, mm -hmm. didn't, God didn't like him and was afraid of him, so he sort of buried him away. Yeah, and, he, couldn't and, destroy, he couldn't destroy his creation, so he had to bury him away in a little a universe of his own. Yeah, and uh, someone, this, this enemy team or these enemy people, had gotten in there and unlocked the doors or done something to let him out. Yeah, the breach. They had opened the breach. And every time the, the breach was open... Uh, 
the firstborn would end up claiming a little more of our world. So and and all of these horrible creatures would come sort of spilling out, or yeah, I hate it when that happens. Yeah, mm. and the Rubal Kali had been uh, at the center of a lot of you know world uh, uh, conflicts because they, it was basically a lot of a lot of people wanted to take possession of the Rubal Kali, being this city in the middle of the desert, but it was really powerful because that's where uh, you know that was. Um, in, in the paranormal, you know, world, whoever controlled Rubal Kali would get power over, you know, the world, so. Yeah, I never quite understood how exactly they would do that. Yeah, they, they, they did mention that the Nazis tried to, the Nazis tried to um, control Rubal Kali and all that stuff. I guess basically what they wanted to was to keep anybody from opening the Rubal Kali yeah. so Firstborn could control our world. So basically, that's what the Jericho Squad was about. And the team members, one of them was a priest who could resurrect people. Uh, another one, there was a woman who could uh, use her own blood as a weapon. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. A bloodomancer. And blood there was uh, there was a guy who had like there was something about his arm. I can't remember what it was. He had made a pact with a fire demon, so his his arm. Um, was always like on fire and he, it was covered by this mechanism and whenever you uncovered his arm you could bring forth these fire snakes that would destroy your enemies that's right yeah yeah that, that's what it was and then there was another woman that was psychokinetic right mm -hmm. so she was a sniper and she could sort of curve the bullets around and yeah <clears throat> you, it was like that movie with angelina jolie yeah before that <laughs> yeah uh, you would control the ghost bullets, and it would go into bullet time and really slow, and you could, like, aim it, and with one bullet, you could, like, kill people and turn the corner and kill another guy. So that was really useful sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a cool game. It was it was really difficult beating it on the hardest difficulty. Oh, yeah, I just finished that game, like, in the easy or medium difficulty. I never went for the hard one. It was really, really difficult at, at the beginning yeah. when... While you still weren't used to the gameplay and switching from teammate to teammate. Yeah, and all of a sudden you got all these these things that are really hard to kill that are swarming you, and or they, they surround you, or they, they sneak up behind you. Yeah, and my computer was not that powerful at the time, so if I had to play it like on easy or medium, because otherwise we would be swarmed by enemies, and the, the game would just start going really, really slow and overheat my computer. Oh, that's not yeah. cool. Yeah, and so um, the one thing that I didn't like about it was these uh, quick time events that would happen. Uh -oh. So, like, you're walking along and, like, a pit opens up under you and you're like, press A, Z, you know, A, B, X, Y, A, A, B, B. And then if you don't do it right, it puts you back at the beginning of the event again and you have to do it all over again. So you'd be yeah. repeating this falling down, you know, over and over and over until you got it right and then you could move on. Yeah, I, I thought those parts were pretty easy. You just had to press the button. Uh, I, yeah. What I really thought was hard was when you had to kill these blood giant creatures or whatever that you had to destroy these... Uh, you had to remove this diamond from their, their foreheads or something. Yeah. It was it was in the uh, the one where you have the, the children and the Templars, mm. I think. Yeah. That's full of the castle that's full of like blood rivers and stuff. Yeah. And I, I couldn't figure out what I had to do with those monsters. And... Uh, and, uh, you know, I only found out almost by accident that I had to destroy, like, this this point in, in the exact middle of their heads that I had to destroy only when they were, like, vulnerable. Yeah. Because otherwise, you'd just keep on shooting them and shooting them and shooting them, and nothing would happen. They would just, like, you know, get weak and, you know, pant for a little bit, and then they would get back up and fight you again. But apart from that, that was fine. I mean, like I said, it's just a few parts were, like, a little too long, and and in the beginning, I mean, when you went to Rubal Kali, do you remember that that those winged monsters with yeah. the with the elongated fingers and you know metal things on their on their bodies? Yeah. Did you make the connection with the first Cenobites of the Hellbound Hearts? Because the, they're those monsters have these chains opening up their eyes and going through their face. And uh, that was the exact hmm. that was the exact uh, description. For <clears throat> That's life. interesting. 
in the Hellbound Heart. In fact, there was actually one mask that someone made of the first Cenobite in Hellbound Hearts. And if you look at that mask, it's just like that monster in Jericho. If I can find the comparison, I'll, I'll put it up on the show notes. Yeah, that I would be cool. That was the first thing on my mind when I saw it. It was a very atmospheric game. And the first thing that, that kind of caught my attention was the, the empty quarter. Is the yeah. same as what's mentioned in Weave World, is the, the empty quarter, which was the site of Eden. Yes. You know, where yes. Uriel, the, the, the angel of... The that fire was completely, angel. completely connected to Weave World, yeah. The Rubal Kali, the, mm-hmm. uh, the empty quarter, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's well spotted. And the, the little, there's a little kid that shows up. A uh, little kid that, you know, his skin is completely black. And yeah. he's like calling us and calling us. And I think, uh, well, that, that's the first one, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and there were different levels. I mean, one, we'd have to, we'd have to battle the souls of those who had <clears> breached <throat> the box in the past. We had to fight like Nazis. And Templars. Uh-huh. And when you were fighting Nazis, you would find uh, people from the Department of Occult Warfare that had been trapped there the last time the breach was open, which were these English guys, you know, with their gas masks and their, you know, helmets, mm-hmm. light helmets. And and then after that, I think you went into, you had to fight a fallen Catholic priest from the Middle Ages. And then you would, you would you, your friends there in that level would be Templars. Uh, but uh, but the Templars were also a little deluded. They thought the demons were actually angels. You remember that? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and after that, you went into the Roman times. You had to <clears> fight <throat> this uh, Roman governor and six and 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 uh, for the Romans, uh, what were the the allies that we had? Uh, they were like uh, I f- I forgot that level. We had some allies there. I think I can't remember. And then you had to fight six ancient Sumerian priests who were the first to banish the firstborn, but ultimately fell victim to its corruption. And after that, you would fight the firstborn inside a cave, um, which was a really hard battle. Yeah. Really hard battle. So uh, how did you guys do the first time around? Uh, okay, I mean, I played it on easy, I think, first, so... I, uh, I didn't play it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't play that many games anymore. <laughs> yeah, every time I look, you're mostly just on Netflix. Oh, that's that's Gwen. Gwen is on Netflix. Oh, really? I, I the last uh, yeah the last Xbox game I played was uh, the new Deus Ex, which I really liked. But mm. um, that's yeah. L- lately, I just I just I have not been playing games. I've been I've been mostly doing other stuff, <laughs> working mostly. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll drop everything for a couple games that are coming out. But uh, yeah. I've pretty much only I only play games by Sega now, or you know Clive Barker, or if they're Godzilla games. I am, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to the new uh, the new XCOM, the the Fire Axis one that's done mm. by the the, the, the uh, what's his butt, um, uh, Sid Meier's company. So oh, that yeah. that I will probably drop everything and play, but. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, Jer- Jericho was a thing. I remember when it came out, and I remember it was like, hey, cool, this is like a full-on next-generation game. Like, that is that is a Clyde Barker game. It was like, it was about time. Because, yeah. Well, uh, Undying, was, like, it was, Undying was the last, like, big-budget one before Jericho, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, as far as I can tell. Yeah. So, basically, there have been two Clyde Barker games, right? Um, well, oh, yeah, right. and then the Nightbreed ones. Yeah, well, sure, yeah, the Nightbreed ones, right. But <laughs> one's actually designed by Clyde Barker. Yeah. I think it was just Undying and Jericho, right? Yeah. That's a shame. I mean, if there's one thing that Clyde Barker does well is, you know, create these um, worlds. And for, for the computer games, that would have been great to see more. Like, a, I don't know, an Aberrat graphic adventure or something like that. That'd be great. Yeah, that would be cool. There's just not enough time. He doesn't have enough time in the day to do all this stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. well, yeah. Also, with with games, there's like so many things that are out of your control. Like as a creator, you just can't. Yeah. It's it's, it's not like writing or painting. It's like you know, it's a team of you know, so many people and technology constraints, and then you know, you're 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 
they're working for how many, however many years on on a AAA project, and it's just yeah. it's a big ship. You know, it's a bigger ship really in some ways than, than making a movie because movies can be done quickly and games really can't. Yeah, gosh, do you, do you remember how long it took to make uh, Duke Nukem uh, Forever? Oh yeah, the, the, that's sort of in its own category because yeah. because you know Duke Nukem, but uh, yeah. Well, was it like twenty years or twenty? I don't. It know. wasn't twenty years. It was. Uh, that's why well, it has that I mean, name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Duke Nukem Forever, also known as Did Not Finish, but uh, uh, uh <clears throat> finally they uh they, they released it. But I think yeah, I think it was sort of like there there were reasons they weren't ever finishing it, like that were sort of related to the contract for the game and stuff. So it was sort of right. not, not a scam, but something was up with 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 the bookkeeping. <laughs> Yeah, and did, did you guys remember that um, Jericho? There was they showed up in Playboy like hot girls of, of video games. Oh yeah, that's right. I'd forgotten about that. Really? <laughs> okay, well I'm gonna have to say this because I put this up as a blog post back then when I had my blog called uh, Hellraiser Gallery, and there was I, I'm trying to remember the names of the characters. Uh, they were the two girls uh, in the team. Yeah, the, the Blood like Witch a, and the Psychokinetic one. Yeah, one of them had like a samurai sword. The other had these this re- really crazy haircut and, and yeah. face makeup. And uh, they showed up on Playboy's article of the hottest girls in video games. And they showed up naked. Yeah. Which is pretty, uh, you know, pretty fun. Yeah, I remember reading that, but I didn't ever see it or anything. I'm sorry, did you hear the music that just started playing in my computer? Uh, no. Oh, okay, great. Because I opened up a website and it started playing music, so I'm sorry no, about that's that. that's okay. But yeah, that was, those were, um, you know, those were the... the <clears throat> that was showing up on, on, Hell, uh, on Playboy. A couple of characters from the video game... And they were like posing nude for Playboy. That was pretty amazing. I yeah, well, I mean, any press is good press. I guess, yeah. So, um, yeah, but um, it was it was pretty uh, pretty interesting game. Uh, the graphics were amazing, and you know, very moody in the beginning when you're walking into the ruins of the city and you see these these creatures hanging from walls, and you know, just uh, the music was great. I had. Oh, yeah. I I yeah. bought the soundtrack on iTunes. Oh okay, all right, and uh, it was it was pretty pretty good. It was pretty good. I really enjoyed the game. I thought it had it merged completely with Clive Barker's uh, you know unified universe. Yeah, like, you got references to Hellraiser, to Weave World, to you know a lot of stuff. Yeah, um, so it was pretty cool. I really enjoyed it and. Uh, there were just like moments where you kind of lost your way a little bit in the game, but you would find it back easily. So. And they had talked about making a sequel to it, but I don't. I think that Majesco, uh, or I mean Codemasters, probably isn't doing so well now. Or, or they may be out of business. I can't remember. Oh really? Oh that's tough. Yeah, I don't remember what was going on with Codemasters, but yeah, there was some there was some turmoil. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, that would have been that would have been good, you know, to have a sequel. Yeah. Uh, I I would imagine that uh, to have a sequel to Jericho, they would probably have to make it in the future because that would mean the breach would have to open again. And no, I, uh, I, I mean, if it's just about that team, they because the team was called Jericho. Sure. Yeah. So right. they could be anywhere doing anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they could go and solve some other supernatural mystery, some, right. some currents, you know. Hey, somewhere in Minnesota, this ocean just popped out of nowhere. Let's see what it is. <laughs> yeah. And they would go there and they would find, like, a Malingo and Candy Quackenbush. That's um, right. That would have been cool. Or they could be, or they could solve Encyclopedia <laughs> Brown mysteries. <laughs> Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, um, uh, anything else on on Jericho? That's our that's really our last video game. There's nothing that we know about that's in production or anything like that. Well, I don't know. Do you want to say anything, Matt? Huh? What? Say again? <laughs> <laughs> would you like okay. to say something? Would you like to say something else uh, about Jericho or any other game? Oh, I don't. I I haven't played it, so yeah. Okay. I, I, so. 
So our, our other main topic is uh, art books. And this one we'll just go over really, really briefly. Um, the first one I ever saw with a lot of Clive's art in it is a book called Pandemonium. Uh, and this was done, I think, in 91 by Eclipse Books. Yeah, the, the publication date for Pandemonium. So Pandemonium is a series of a whole bunch of, like, just descriptions of Clive Barker's work, and it's got interviews with all these people who are, um, uh, you know, have worked with Clive. And, and uh, there's one interview between Nicholas Vince, who we've interviewed on the podcast, where he interviewed Clive Barker. It was called, I think, The Luggage in the Attic. Okay. And um, so just, there, but there's a lot of Clive Barker doodles, like, all over the margins and, you know, everywhere all around uh, this book, which is kind of cool. Uh -huh. So it's not exactly an art book. It's more of like a, hey, you know, here's all this cool stuff you should know about Clive Barker book. There was also that... That book, uh, Shadows in Eden, that's also shock full of like drawings and paintings. And yeah, stuff. and that one is definitely a biography. Is Pandemonium the one where the cover has like Clyde Barker's face with a couple of hands coming out of the side of his head? Yeah, and his face is on kind of a cross. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah. I don't have that book, to be honest, but I've always wanted to buy it, so I'll, I'll get it soon. And... So next is Clive Barker Illustrator. And I was, when I actually, when I went to Texas Frightmare Weekend, um, and signing with Clive, yeah, Frightmare. So um, I was in line and I saw a guy had the a hardcover of Clive Barker Illustrator and I didn't know such a thing existed. So I went and looked, looked him up on eBay and I bought the hardcovers. So I used to just have the paperbacks, and they were all messed up for my iguana. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, Aethnicus. <laughs> what did Aethnicus do to your uh, Aethnicus your climbed all over him and pooped on him. Uh. Yeah, so I, I remember I was at a book signing in, like, 92 or something like that, and, and uh, I had to apologize to Clive when he was signing this poopy Clive Barker illustrator. <laughs> But you were wearing these fabulous lizard skin shoes, right? <laughs> no. Oh. My mom got rid of him, though, when I was in college. So, I would yeah, have but... thrown that iguana off the window. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I was pretty upset. He was really super powerful, I guess, because I, I found out you're not supposed to feed him meat, and I fed him canned dog food all the time. So oh, no. He would uh, jump up in the air and, and, uh, and sort of punch the top of the cage until it came off. <laughs> and I remember uh, one time um, Janelle had loaned me all these Anne Rice books, and I didn't. I did, after reading the first one, I didn't like them, so I used them all as weight to keep the top of the, the cage from coming <laughs> off. And he still, even with all those, the, all the the weight of the Anne Rice, you know, bibliography, he still punched his way out of the cage and got all over my books and stuff. Uh, uh, too bad he didn't poop on the Anne Rice books. <laughs> I know he's he, he, he even he won't poop on those. Oh well. Yeah. No, I don't know why. I just I mean I read Interview with a Vampire and then it's like I'm not reading any more of these. <laughs> yeah, I, I I didn't figure they'd they'd be your uh, they'd be your speed. <laughs> yeah, I mean I I don't know. I thought that the uh, the main character was so whiny. Like I don't want to be a vampire through the whole thing. <laughs> Like, okay. your vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> so Illustrator was like two books? Yeah, there's Illustrator 1 and 2. Um, Illustrator 1 has, um, there's a lot of color, I mean there's a lot of black and white, but there's a lot of color paintings in here too, and, and uh, it has all of the uh, all the covers for the Books of Blood. Yeah. And it has all the Cabal stuff, and it even has some preliminary sketches for the Books of Blood covers. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. And it's got a lot of uh, written description of, you know, um, Clive Barker's work and how he, you know, who his influences are and stuff like that. All right. So I, I don't have uh, the illustrator books either. Um, they're really cool. They're, they're, there's a lot of really interesting, okay. like, black and white, old, old line drawings. I, I just never got to, to buy them, but, you know, they're on my list, so... I remember once I was at a comic convention and this um, this guy had a T-shirt of uh, demon poking his eyes out. Do you, yeah. Do you know that drawing? 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so, so I, so I bought that T-shirt and I wore that thing to death. <laughs> I, I, there was an actual sculpture of that. Oh, is it really? Yeah, there is an actual sculpture that they made a, a a kit out of demon putting his eyes out. Wow. Yeah. And then I also had a T-shirt of that one um, that picture. I think it was on a cover of one of the Dread fanzines. And trying to remember um, what that one is called. It's got that sort of gloomy guy standing there with a. Oh, is it? Uh, is it the guy that's like sitting down and hugging his knee? No, no, that's that's like the self-portrait one, right? Right, yeah. No, it's, um, gosh. Is it a Cyclops guy? Nope. I'm not seeing it now. But I had it. Oh, here it is. Uh, Dream Image, it's called. Dream Image? Yeah, it's a, it's this, it's this really sort of stark contrasty black and white um, picture, and there's a guy standing there with his hands folded in front of him. Oh, okay, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, yeah, I've seen this one. Yeah, so I had a t-shirt of that, too, and both of those shirts have fallen apart, and I cut yeah. out the pictures, you know, and, and uh, from the shirts and, you know, threw the rest away. I've got well, them in a bag somewhere. Well, Clyde Barker's black and white ink sketches are pretty appropriate for t-shirts, right? I mean, yeah. uh, for some reason, they just work really well. I have uh, a feeling those t-shirts are all bootleg, but... Yeah, they should be. I don't yeah. know. That uh, that uh, dream image that you're talking about is from '92. Yeah, it was it's ink on paper, 11.5 by 8 inches, exhibited at the Best Cutler Gallery in '93, and it's published in the books Illustrator, Shadows of Eden, Dread, Visions of Heaven and Hell. Uh, okay, there you go. So, so Visions of Heaven and Hell probably has quite a bit of overlap with the um, the Illustrator books. Oh yeah, I've seen a lot of black and white sketches in Visions of Heaven and Hell that. Yeah. That I'd seen before in like Shadows in Eden. Yeah. Uh, well, and actually, there these are in, in Visions of Heaven and Hell. These are much better quality because that same picture, Dream Image. I'm looking at it now, mm -hmm. and you can see the, the 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 shades of the brush strokes and stuff. So it's not just black and white. It's you know, it's a perfect uh, rendering, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. I, I love Visions of Heaven and Hell. It's 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 a really nice art book. By the way, I'm uh, including in the show notes the the sculpt of Demon putting his eyes out. Oh, cool! Yeah, I just, I just found it, and it's really nice. I just sent it to you by Skype. Yeah, I'm I'm pasting these things into the notes as we go, so that it'll make it easier. All right, it's pretty cool looking. Yeah, I I I love some of Clyde Barker's black and white sketches, like that one, the self portrait one that was in the cover of Dread magazine, mm -hmm. I think, or was it the Lost Souls? newsletter. I kind of mix those two together. And uh, also there's this, this painting that I love from Clive, which is, there's a silhouette of a head, and then there's like a little monster living inside the head. And it's like a little Cyclops monster, and its eye is the eye in the head silhouette. So that, that's really, really amazing. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can find it. I know where it is. Um, but yeah, that's one of the uh, paintings I love. And um, what else is there? Like you said, there's a lot of cool stuff. There's, there's stuff from, um, you, well, usually Clyde Barker, his, his creatures usually are like bald-headed and they have like big ears and, yeah. uh, and sometimes they have one eye. Uh, and they're, they're usually like sometimes they're naked and invariably they have like an erection. Yeah. So, uh, but still it, it gets pretty cool. Like there's one... Um, black and white drawing that I remember from memory because I don't have the books right here right now. I'm on vacation. But there's one called I Am Born of Myself and it's like this creature that's like pulling himself off of himself and it's, it's, I can't explain it. It's like it's like uh, he's coming out from between his own legs mm. and you know, he's pulling his arms out and it's a really impressive piece of uh, art that he just made that with a brush and black ink. So... Pretty cool. Wow. It's on Visions of Heaven and Hell. Yeah, I'm trying to remember that. I don't right now, but... Yeah. And, um... 
So, Matt, do you have that book, Visions of Heaven and Hell? I'm, I'm, it's in my lap. I'm looking through it right oh, okay. now. <laughs> yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a wonderful book. I thought at first it would only have, like, abrad paintings, but then I realized, no, it's got it's got a lot of stuff there that comes from way back. Yeah. Oh, even before, you know, abrad was even considered. Um and then that book is that book is a really nice book from Rizzoli and uh, hardcover. If mine is you know cloth yeah. bound, it's a really beautiful book. Yeah. I only have two complaints about the book, which are very you know, I think they're everybody will forgive me for the first complaint, which is the the edges of the pages of the book were supposed to be gilded. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, but unfortunately, the way they made that kind of uh, decoration for the pages made them all stick together. And this was a problem that they addressed at the time when the book came out. And they're like, oh, here's a way to un- unglue all your pages because some people are saying that their pages are stuck together. So you got to, like, grab hold of the pages and flip them really quickly with your finger and, you know, try to get them to loosen up. So in my case, that didn't really work that well. I had to get, like, a knife, a really sharp knife thin knife and I had to like individually separate pages because the the, the, the gilded edges stuck them together. Oh. Uh, it ended up not becoming the beautifully gilded effect that one would expect because I had to like separate them and I was getting a lot of like golden flakes on my on my table. And I was like, oh shucks, you know, that you know, I was a little upset about that. And the the only other complaint that I have about the book is that I sometimes think that they could have like included the small black and white sketches mm-hmm. and just make them like smaller decorations of the pages because sometimes they will use a whole page of the book and they just put in like a, a half page sketch in there. Oh and yeah. Sometimes page, sometimes on the bottom of the page, and I'm like, well, such a big page and only one small black and white drawing when you have so many wonderful aberrant paintings with so much color. Yeah. If you could, in, could include this. Well, and he's, uh, he's talking sure about have... making a book of just aberrant paintings. Well, yeah, not just that, but I, I mean, you know, those black and white sketches that they, they include there. I mean, I remember there's one black and white sketch that they occupy two pages with. Yeah. Or there's one floating depth head that uh, it's basically just black and then like a ghostly face. They occupy two pages with that. And I'm like, well, I, I think that this would, this could have been a little, you know, better distributed. You know, I mean, if you, if you flip around the book, which I'm sure you're probably doing right now, mm-hmm. you might see some of the examples that I'm talking about. You know, it's, but of course, they have also great stuff there. They have like these gatefold pages that open up and you get like a painting split on four pages you know there's one um there's one banquet with between angels and demons which is really really funny because the banquet with angels and demons occupies like three pages or four and uh they're all like eating and you can see under the table and one of the angels is jerking off one of the devils (laughs) That's, that's really funny that's quiet you know always you know so yeah, I mean, I never, I never got any piece of original art from Clive. Uh, I know some people that we know do have originals from Clive. I mean, yeah, Maureen from from the Fifth Dominion Forum used to have like, uh, you know, the Carver and her husband, which is a um, beautiful painting. But he, but you know, she doesn't have it anymore. She she sold it. Yeah. Well. And people from Occupy Media, like Chris Bradshaw. Chris Bradshaw has a bunch of Clyde Barker original paintings and, you know, sketches, I think. Uh, you remember when he made his Occupy Media sign, he's standing in front of his own art collection? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's, you know, that's pretty impressive right there. And Russell, Russell Charrington, uh, he's also a big Clyde Barker art fan, and yeah. I think he has paintings himself. So, well, and he's, it helps to be friends with, with yeah. Clyde. Yeah, it helps to be friends with Clive. That's true. I mean, you you visited Clive's studio. You've seen all the paintings there. What did you see? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I saw they they were all you know they were all on on these the canvases all sort of uh, were on these racks and stacked together, mm-hmm. and and 
you know, and there was a whole, you know, a whole room full of those. And then there were more in a tent in the backyard. Oh, wow. I saw the, I saw the full, um, you know, the full three canvas painting of, of the Aberat of the islands. Yeah. You know, and I have a picture of me standing in front of it just to kind of get the scale. Cause I had no idea it was that big. How many canvases is it made out of? Do you uh, remember? Three, um, but they're but they're huge. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen your picture. It's pretty. It's pretty cool that you're standing right next to it. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Um, so that was that was a pretty unforgettable experience. Just being able to see all that stuff, and you know, and walking into um, walking into the area where the paintings were, and just seeing Christopher Carey and just kind of lying around there. Yeah. You'd be like, hey, can I take that home? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. And there's there's also some paintings in the book that are, you know, really impressive because of the emotional charge that they, they have. Like when Clive's father passed away, um, he has a chapter in the book where he talks about this painting that he made, which is of a, uh, a man... Uh, holding his face in his hands, crying, mm -hmm. sitting on top of a rock that looks like an egg. It's it's on visions of heaven and hell. And um, and up to a certain point, I remember seeing some uh, videos from Clyde Barker's studio, and that painting is there on the wall of his studio. So, and he was he was mentioning how that painting he he made it as a way to come to terms with his own grief. So it means a lot to him. You know, there's a lot of symbolism in that painting. He's really taken to painting a lot, a lot more than uh, than he had in the past. And I think um, you know, Aberat is a way, you know, to do to try, well. You know, people still want me to keep writing, so I'm now I'm going to do this. Yeah. He's like he's he's, he's figured out a project that that, that the art is. Uh, you know, integral too, which is which is awesome. Yeah, and it's a five book project, so it's gonna be it's gonna last for a while. Yeah, yeah I, well, I love his um, uh, his uh, his landscapes and his you know his the non figurative stuff is 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 as successful as the as the, as the figurative stuff he does, and and generally people kind of stick to one or the other, you know. <laughs> and and he he's just got this great sense of landscapes and being able to just make them vibrant and make them work and make them make them work like his figures work and, and they're just where is this one this uh the one in 89 he talks about on page 89 that's uh one of his favorites and then, like these these sort of like monster as city things that are just that just always kick my ass i just love them it's like a big a big sense of line work and um in his paintings like like that they you you see the ink drawings, like the black and white ink drawings, and then you see the paintings, and you like you, oh, yeah. you can draw a line between them. Yeah. You know, so that one on eighty nine is for Aberat. Um, yeah. There was a path, right? That was uh, that was made of dragon bones. Oh yeah, that's oh, because think, uh, that, that's a dragon that kidnapped and killed uh, Princess Candy. No wait, uh, Princess. Ah, uh, forgot the name. Boa. Well the. Yeah, the Princess Boa. Yeah. Uh, on her wedding day, inside a church, the dragon just kind of like slid his way into the church and ate her, right? Yeah. And then the prince killed the dragon, and that became the um, the stairway with his bones. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, any uh, other um, any other artwork that we can think of to talk about? Oh, yeah. I mean, gosh. There, there's some of my favorite paintings. One of them is called Icon. Uh, Icon is this painting that I don't know if you're familiar with it by name. Mm -hmm. it, it's this, uh, this guy that's got his hand, hands in his pockets, and his chest area is another face. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know what, you, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah that, I, that's a great one. That's, that's an amazing painting. I always, you know, I always loved that painting. I would like to have a poster of it. Yeah. And, uh, I just think it's amazing. Another one that I also enjoy very much is, um, apart from Icon, is The Arsonist. The Arsonist has a story. When they were coming up with the book for Rizzoli, Visions of Heaven and Hell, they came up with a problem because they wanted to include The Arsonist 
And I remember when they, they were, Revelations were asking people, okay, there's a problem. We, want to, we really want to include the arsonist into the, the book, but it's been sold to a collector, and we have no idea, you know. Oh, I the, remember that, yeah. At the point where it is or who has it, or we don't have the contact of the person who bought it. So if you guys could, you know, help us find uh, who has the arsonist so we could take it a, little, a really good picture of it to include in the book. The arsonist is this guy that's holding a torch, and he himself is on fire, and his hair is on fire, and it's just this powerful red and yellow painting, and uh, it's, it's, it's like a fire demon or something, and he's holding this torch. And uh, if you look at the book, you'll see that they, they have included the arsonist, although the picture seems to be a little less uh, sharp than most of the other paintings. Mm. I don't know if they actually got to find the, the painting again or not. So or I they did they, a print of a print. Yeah, maybe that. So, and do you know uh, what page that's on? No, it's on Visions of Heaven and Hell, but I don't know which page exactly because I don't have the book with me. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. But um, yeah, it's it, it's 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 hard to miss. It's just this page that's all red and yellow, and it's just pretty impressive. Um, what else, what else is there? Um, of course, nobody, nobody can draw a chicken like Clive. I mean, <laughs> you remember on the, on the first book of Aberat, uh, you got like, you got like the, this page that's just chicken. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's really funny. And, I, I and it, yeah. towards the end of, uh, Visions of Heaven and Hell, like, it's like the, probably the, the last, fi the fourth or so page to the last. Uh, there's a two-page um, painting of Princess Breath, and I got to see the original of that one because it's hanging up in the waiting room at uh, Clive's studio. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And there's also those three sisters from the 25th Yeah, Owl. the, the Phantomaya. Yeah, the Phantomaya. That, that's also, um, I think in that book, is it like a double page or something? I think it is. That could be. I have to. I have to find it. But yeah, yeah this is a great book. Yeah. Um, what else is there? Oh, and they've got. Um, let's see. There are only just a few from Aberat, but a lot of other stuff. Because oh, I yeah. think this came out like right at the beginning, before maybe even before the first Aberat ever, you know, came out. Yeah, uh, like, for example, I know that one of the first paintings that Clyde Barker did for the Aberats was um, John Mischief. Yeah. He, he, he painted John Mischief, and the, you know... Well, I'm, I'm seeing the arsonist now. I see what you mean. It's not, as, it's not quite as vibrant as the others. Right, right. So that was the arsonist. That was one of the things that I remember, that they were looking for that desperately. Yeah. And even though Clyde Barker info is the official resource for Clyde Barker, if you guys go on ClydeBarker.com and go to the section marked Visions, there is so much of Clyde Barker's art there. There are galleries and galleries of artwork that you can go through. I mean, I, I remember I used to go through like like ten years ago. I used to go through the that website. You know, I used to you know copy all those images, download them to my computer. I would like, you know, look at them. I would, you know, visit all the uh, galleries over and over again because I just love to see the painting so much. And that used to be the official Clive Barker website. And I remember I would check it every day and look at the stuff. And after a while, they stopped updating it, and I couldn't figure out why. And I was getting madder and madder. I was like, what do I do? I, you know, there's nothing here anymore. And, and then, then, then I finally figured out about Clivebarker.info. Yeah, yeah, and there is, I think there was, used to be a, a website about Clyde Barker's art. It was Clyde Barker, uh, what, what was it like? Uh, there is a website that's just like Clyde Barker artwork. Is it Clyde Barker? You can and, also get, while you're looking for that, you can also get, um, there are Clive Barker trading cards. Mm -hmm. And they all have, it's all illustrations. They're probably all in Illustrator or, or Visions of Heaven and Hell, but it's pretty cool. Um, they're these, you know, just all black and white illustration trading cards. And they're all sort of separated into groups based on what thing they're based on. 
What about that collection that was called a box of blood? Was that from Hellraiser? Uh, no, it's they're they're uh, the the box of blood are um, it, the the art is by some other guy. It's not Clive Barker, and no. and it's um, basically his ideas of what you know things from the books of blood would look like. Okay. Yeah, I found the website. It's called ClydeBarkerImaginer.com. dot com. Ah. Yeah, have you ever been there? Uh, no. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, I, I found this, this website some time ago, and uh, it's pretty cool. It's got a lot of, you know, material from Clyde Barker here. Uh, ClydeBarkerImaginer.com So, if, if you want to find some Clyde Barker art, too, uh, you can go there. Okay. And, uh... Oh, it's doing his signature. Although, that's his old signature. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, when I'm on Skype, my, my internet gets really slow, so... Oh, okay. Website is not opening for me, but hey, it's opening for you, so. <laughs> Yeah. So it separates into paintings and drawings, that's pretty cool, and it's copyright 2012, so obviously they keep this updated. Yeah, so that's another one for the show notes. Yeah, that's uh, cool. I will paste that in. Um, so on trading cards, uh, Clive Barker did a few um, a few of the trading cards of the Magicka card game. Uh, so in 1996, there was a Magic uh, the Gathering style trading card game called uh, Magicka. Yeah. And Clive Barker did three or five of the rare cards. So. But, uh but are those um, Imagica related, or are those just like uh, images that he had made, and he just included those in the collection? They're they're images that he made already that he that got included. Okay, because yeah. that's one of the things that I also wanted to mention about Clyde Barker artwork is that we have drawings for you know the Hellbound Heart. We have drawings from Clyde Barker for the Cenobites. We have drawings for Weave World. We have we, we have, have those like, Rorschach paintings from Cabal. We have those Rorschach paintings for Cabal. We have artwork for the Thief of Always. But we don't seem to have artwork for Imagica. I mean, yeah. I don't remember, personally, I don't recall ever seeing any sketches or art that Clive made for Imagica. Well, there's one, um, and, and I may be wrong, somebody can correct me on this, but there's one that I didn't really recognize in these cards. It's called Pulisic. And it's this two-legged creature with teeth, and, and it's got arms on its back or something. Or No, those are like little trees on its back. What's it called? Uh, well, the card is called Pulisic. P-U-L-L-U-S-I-C. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know what that is. I don't either. I'm, There's so many thing, my... terms and things from Imagica that it's like, I can't remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the characters I always loved from the... the the, the book was the Nullianac. Oh, yeah. Yeah, with the, the hands that have yeah, electricity I, between the... Or their head is a hand. Or yeah, two hands I, I, praying. I even tried making my own version of the Nullianac once, and I painted something up, and it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I made it. And I know that, um, that artist... Um, I don't want to mispronounce his name. Um, something Kirk... Hang on. Oh, Richard Kirk. Richard Kirk, yeah. Yeah. Richard Kirk made amazing artwork for the uh, Imagica book. I never bought that edition because it was paperback, and also I didn't like that they made it in two uh, two books. Yeah. Well, the, the the artwork is just amazing. I mean, huh. he he has like a, a series of illustrations. There's the Nullianac. There's Apex Amendios. Wow. Uh, there's the retreat at Godolphin Estate, which is this landscape with a little stone temple. It's just beautiful artwork. And uh, I, I have that, that version with the, uh, with the plates. Really, that, really that not. That reminds me, isn't there, um, there's Barlow's Guide to Fantasy? Yeah. Right, that, that, that book has, it has one picture of a creature from Imagica, I think. But it's not a painting by Clive or anything. Are you talking about Wayne Barlow? Yeah, I think. The guy that made that book called Inferno and everything? No, no. Uh, 
No, it, it's just <laughs> called Barlow's Guide to... Like, there's a whole bunch of different ones. One of them, there's, like, Gar Barlow's Guide to Fantasy and one that's, like, science fiction and... I can't... But but this, this Barlow's Guide to Fantasy was just our different artists, you know, painting pictures of different, you know, creatures from different things, and there's... I think one of them is has an oviate from from uh, from really? Magica. Yeah, I'll oh, I'll okay. I'll take a picture of it for the for the uh, foot for the notes. I'm looking at Barlow's Guide to Fantasy on Wikipedia, and if it is what I think it is, this is a book that was painted by Wayne Barlow. Oh, okay. Wayne, yeah, Wayne Barlow is this amazing artist that also made this fantastic book called uh, Barlow's Inferno, where mm -hmm. he makes like Inferno landscapes. Uh, and, he okay. involved, and he was involved with this show called Forbidden Planet, uh, Alien Planet, where you have like these two man-made uh, probes that go to a, you know, a made-up planet, and they're like going around. And it's like a documentary of what would happen if we went to another planet with probes. And all hmm. the creatures in that alien world were invented by Wayne Barlow. Oh, that's so, cool. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, uh, I see what you mean. Uh, it sounds like a really good book. So this has an oviate in it. Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll I'll take a picture for the show notes. Hmm, okay. So and you collect these Ima Imagica cards, right? Yeah, I have all of them but seven right now. Oh, wow, that's pretty uh, cool. Actually, Mark Miller, uh, <laughs> that works with Clive, really, really helped me out. Um, that's how we became friends was, you know, trading these cards. And I helped him finish out, up his collection, and then he's helped me get to where I'm at. But we've all sort of hit a... I've hit a wall as far as, like, finding people that trade these anymore. How about on eBay? Eh, no. I mean, I've got saved searches. I'm waiting, you know, for stuff to come up. But Well, I hope you find those. <laughs> Thanks. Are you talking about just regular cards or the special fancy cards? Uh, well... <laughs> No, actually, the the super special ones I have all of. It's just there's seven rare cards that I don't have. Oh, okay. So they're just normal. You know, they're the ones that they shouldn't be that hard to find. It's just there's only like four or five people that you can trade with, and you know, I've I've done all of the trading with them already. Well, I hope you can find that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So any listeners out there that want to trade. Uh, Imagica cards, I would be really generous because I have tons and tons and tons of duplicates. <laughs> yeah. start, uh, start setting a thing of a trading post. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so that was the only card game that was based on Clive Barker's stuff, too, right? Yes. Yeah, the only one that's a game, for sure. So okay. the Box of Blood is kind of... Those are interesting cards, but it's not really Clive's art. Um, so is there anything else that you guys had to talk about? Well, I have one, I have one card from, I think I have one card from that Imagica game. Oh, really? Yeah. This came with, uh, this was a rare card that came on the, uh, for the, uh, subscribers of the Lost Souls newsletter. Oh, okay. Which, uh, what's it called? It's Clive Barker. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yep, Clive I have that one. Oh, okay. It's by Barker, and it's just like um, it's like a painting of of him. Yeah, and it's With, got like uh, his this face is dissolving on the right side. Yeah, it's like this autark will you know get to skip a turn or something like that in yeah. the bag. That was published by this little company called Zahara Pushu, right? Uh, yes. Zahara Pushu is is a little bit of trivia. Was the name of one of the little dream squid that swims in quiddity? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was a cool trivia bit. Yeah, and oh, and um, at one at, at one book signing, I gave Clive one of the player mat things. That's a poster, you know, for the card game. Oh yeah. And he went crazy for it, or I I had him sign one, and he went crazy for it. And I'm like, really? Because I have like seven of these, and he's like, I'd never seen this before. I want it. <laughs> and, he, and he told his assistant, you know, that he needed to uh, he needed to to track this thing down. So I just I got their uh, I got their address and I mailed them all of my extras. Oh, that was that was really nice of you. And I thought, you know, he, and, then, he, and now I see he said he hung it in. A, he sent me a letter in, you know, th of thanks and said I hung it in my office and now I've actually visited and seen where it's hanging up. Wow. 
That's that's pretty cool. And he also did like a, a painting of your son before your son was born, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was kind of nice. I was at that signing. I was um, that was at the Texas one. Uh, I was in the very. I was towards the front of the line, and he had gotten all sort of caught up in photographing this one guy that had these weird contacts that made his eyes sort of glow green. Mm -hmm. and it took so long and, and he wanted to do a good picture for me because I'd spent a lot of money on autographs because that was one of the things where you have to pay money and, and uh, they said you know what we'll, um, we'll do yours first thing tomorrow you just come to the front of the line so that gave me like overnight to think about what I wanted and I was would have just gotten something like you know from Hellraiser or Nightbreed but then I thought no I want to do something for my son you know that um, so Drew draw an aberration, something aberrant related that he would like, and so he he drew sort of this is what your baby would look like as an aberration child, and he said, you know, there really aren't that many ab children in aberrant. Huh. And it's kind of true. So it's kind of like he's kind of this elf looking uh, kid in the in the drawing, and I can put that in the show notes too. And he he called it something special, right? Uh. It said to the to the boy in the wings because we didn't have a name for him yet. Yeah, uh, I guess it's better than Clyde Barkey calling him Junior. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's that's really cool, you know. I I was gonna. I, he asked me what names we had thought of, and I said, well, you know, one of them was gonna be Barker, and he goes, don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that <laughs> yeah and jennifer didn't like it anyway because it would be like oh the kids are all going to make fun of him really okay well uh yeah we well, you know uh you could have said clive though i mean yeah. Boon. <laughs> Boon. yeah Boon. <laughs> Come on. Aaron. what's your son's name aaron oh you're a fellow of the <laughs> yeah, yeah. They would probably think that you're a fan of Elvis if you call your son Aaron. So. My daughter, Shuna Sazi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would have that been would, fun. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So, so uh, <laughs> we have some questions and feedback to kind of get through here pretty quickly. We're kind of approaching two hours. but uh, oh, yeah. So the first one is from our forum, uh, from David. He said... I don't have anything for the podcast, so I'll just say that I think Jericho had a better story, but my vote goes to Undying. It had more varied levels and better gameplay. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I th thought that Jericho was probably more fun and Undying was more, uh, probably a little creepy. I don't know. They were both pretty creepy. Mm hmm Yeah. I, I, I can see that if I had played Undying before I played Jericho, and if I had played it through, maybe I would have the same opinion. Um, yeah, Undying, I remember, because I, we got Undying right after it came out, and uh, I remember being pretty impressed with it compared to other games at the time, just for presentation and, and just level, yeah. level, level of work that they just put into level design and stuff. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of trivia stuff Andy was pointing out to me. He's like, hey, they did this with the Unreal. And like, he was more into the, uh, the nuts and bolts of it. But mm -hmm. yeah, when it, when it came out, it was a big deal. I remember a lot of... A lot of people I knew were like, ooh, I'm dying. Awesome. Yeah. They're very, yeah. very into it. I, I played them both when they came out, and I, you know, I like them equally. I mean, I, I, th I mean, I think if I gauged how much I liked them in, in their time, you know, I don't know. It's if hard, I went yeah. back now, I would probably like Jericho better. It, it's, hard, it's hard to go back to old, especially first-person shooters, because they just don't. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's like... They're 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 going towards always going towards more realism, more immersion. But yeah, you know, the they, early ones are they can be to, they can be frustrating too. Yeah, and you, and you forget you forget how weirdly like old game control, like old first person shooters. You feel like yeah. you're like on roller skates all the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he also said, "I long for a Barker role playing game, something like Skyrim, except with Dominions, uh, Nelly and X, and Numa powers." Yeah. That would be yeah. awesome. Can you imagine having like an open world role playing game in, in oh, Magicka? Man. See, I'd want I'd, I'd want a more like a more of a more of a ISO top down old school RPG because like the bigger ones like Skyrim just they just take so much money to make and they become they all start to you know acquire the the, the, the quirks of their engines, whereas you get like a, like a top-down game, like a, like a Baldur's Gate or a Planescape Torment. I think a Planescape Torment-style game for, for any hmm. any any of Barker's books would just, 
it would just slot right in. It would work great because it, it would focus on the fiction more. Yeah. You know, someone oh, yeah. kickstarted yeah. that, you know? Yeah. Well, the and idea I, of being in a completely, like, first-person or third-person world is is pretty intriguing, too, to, you know, to oh, be able oh, it'd to be see great, the, yeah. uh, the real, you know, the real full-detailed landscapes and stuff. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I can see. I've never played one of those uh, one of those Elder Scrolls games because I don't have the time. That's like those things are like six hundred hours. Yeah, I I played um, I played Oblivion and I played the the, the newer Fallout games, which are same engine. And, yeah. and back when I did have time, and uh, yeah, they just they just suck you in. You're like you're like I, I have to explore everything. They're very they're very nonlinear and yeah. very um, very much about like discovery. And they take yeah, forever to develop. <laughs> it takes like five years for them to develop a game like that. I could imagine. I was in a forum the other day, and someone showed up, and they had a po- um, they posted a screen cap of their Steam page, and they had like a thousand hours on Skyrim. Oh. Uh-huh. So obviously, yeah, I can't do anything for a thousand hours. It's not like <laughs> that's not making me money. <laughs> I spent two years playing World of Warcraft when it f- first came out. I remember, yeah. I remember you were you were big into World of Warcraft. You were you were raiding and you were doing you were organizing stuff and yeah. And we had a Kung Fu Dragons guild. But <laughs> Excellent. You, yeah, but it was just I don't know. After you know, there was one time when uh, I, it was like two o'clock in the morning, and I was really sick. But everybody wanted me to stay on, and I you know, and I, so I stayed, and I was miserable. And I thought, what am I doing? And yeah, then, exactly. This is supposed to be for fun. <laughs> yeah, so a, a few days later, we quit. Jennifer and I both quit. Yeah, good, good for you. I mean, not not that you should never play World of Warcraft, but like you know, once once it gets to that point where you're just like where the game is work, and yeah, I, I've gotten to that point with games like like single player games that are just this is becoming work, and then I just stop because I'm just like I gotta do something else. Yeah. Like, that I know oh. is enriching my life, like read a book. Yeah, I, I, never, I never understood the people who would wake up at three in the morning because they had to harvest their crops on Farmville. I was like, <laughs> yeah. oh god, yeah, I've yeah, never yeah. played Farmville. Where's the Rawhead Rex Facebook game? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, think that, I think I think that could totally be a market right there. Yeah, the Rawhead Rex Facebook game. <laughs> don't, don't Put that in the show that. notes. <laughs> yeah. Don't give Zinga any Rex Facebook game. <laughs> See if anybody catches it, just stick in the show notes. <laughs> you get a rumor started. By the way, you know, I'm looking at I'm looking at the demonic box art. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And I'm seeing that like the engineer from Prometheus is in the background. Oh, weird, really? I'm not kidding. There's a guy with, you know, that weird uh suit and the helmet with a little elephant's trunk in the yeah. back of the box. So yeah, uh, let me let me show you guys. Um, okay, let me let me show you. Okay, you go on into the next question. I'll just pop this up on. on okay. Screen. So um, yeah, so then on Facebook, uh, Ben Winfield said, "I'd love to see you guys chat about what should be put into a new Nightbreed video game: possible characters, story, gameplay, level design, etc." And definitely when, Decker disappearing at the bottom of the screen. Like that has to be in there somewhere. <laughs> do, 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 do. God, if that's not in there, I won't play it. <laughs> I thought yeah. a lot about. Must... Oh, you're right. Weird. Yeah, yeah, you know, I thought a lot about the. Um, I thought a lot about this question, and I can't think of a good way to do a Nightbreed game. I hate... oh, I know exactly how I do it. Um, I, I'd make it a stealth game, like um, like Thief. Oh, I, I, I would make yeah, I'd make it like a super super creepy like 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 Thief Two, where it's basically you know because there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that you can be that can be shoved into the stealth model like yeah. where, as long as it's know, a side story. I mean, we, we know that. I mean, you can tell from the first two games that it doesn't work when you try to make a video game follow the plot of a movie. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to kind of like because well, what people want they want to play around in Midian, right? You mm-hmm. know, they want to explore Midian and all the creatures of Midian and, and, and just the culture of it. So make it, yeah, make it a stealth game and make it mostly mostly take place in Midian with maybe some you know maybe right. some some bits and pieces and episodes in the town. But yeah, yeah, maybe a, you're a person that got kidnapped and you're in Midian and you have to get out. Yeah, or yeah. you know, or, or or another you know like or, or maybe Boone's not the only one like looking for Midian to have them accept him. Mm. You know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I wish someone would ask me ideas for that because they had so many ideas for a Nightbreed game. I mean, you could do so much stuff. I mean, you could run out of gas on the way to Median, for example. 
No, but seriously, you could go, you, you could like walk into Sheer Neck and try to find and try to find a, a, an available room during the rodeo. And, uh, I don't know. Uh, no. you, you get to you get to talk to Arnie from the hotel. And, uh, you can and, you can drop your eclair on the ground. Yeah. And I don't know, I, you, you could do so much stuff. I mean, you could be in the hospital and see how much Vicodin you can steal while, while Narcisse is taking off his face. <laughs> That's a quick time event. You have to help him take his face off. Yeah. <laughs> X, Y, okay, you've got him here. All right, now, oh, there you go. Now the forehead's off. <laughs> now press button A and then B to help Narcisse jiggle his scalp off. You know? Heal. <laughs> Heal quickly. <laughs> Oh, He's no. got like the God of War music behind it. <laughs> you have a, a quick time event where you drop your pastry on the floor. What would be really, really funny if you could do like Nightbreed, but you could play it like either like Boone or like Decker. Yeah, oh, I'll play Decker, yeah. I, I would want to be Decker assembling people. that house of cards. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, oh, I screwed it up again. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> But but yeah, I mean that that you could put so much stuff in in a game nowadays. It's just crazy. I mean, you, yeah. you have so many choices of uh, actions inside a game. Yeah. And uh, you know, I mean, I would love to to see a game, you know, with the Magicka, the Magicka universe. But it's just that, like you guys were saying, once you try to make a game fit the plot of a book, you have to put the story of the game on rails, and it's yeah. like. Uh, it forces you. For example, a game for Thief of Always. I mean, yeah. what would that what would that be like? It would you have to be like, like a storybook because there's really no other way that you could do it. Yeah, I mean, you could you could like fight the the demon Carne or something, and yeah. try to find try to find toys hidden hidden around the house or something. I don't know. Yeah, but it, it would be hard to make a a game that would you know. Midian Tycoon. <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> you just have your little isometric, you know, Midian has, you know, Midian needs more toilet paper. You know, Midian. Can you imagine? Zapham is upset. Yeah. And then you have to go down and put up a fire or whatever. Priest keeps sneaking into Midian. What do we do? Yeah. Can you remember <laughs> uh, Castlevania? Uh, wait, it wasn't Castlevania. There was one game where you had to find the bones of uh, Dracula or something and, 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 you would find, uh, uh, I, I think it was Castlevania. Wasn't there a Castlevania where you guys had to find, like, Dracula's bones and put them all together? There no, that was Freddy. Ones. No, that was Freddy. Freddy, Nightmare on Elm Street on the NES. No. Oh. Close enough. <laughs> you had to go around uh, ca uh, gathering Freddy's bones so you could put them together or something like that. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> what are you doing? I'm assembling a serial killer. <laughs> I think it was supposed Why? to be... Why? No reason. <laughs> yeah. But you could do the same thing for Baphomet. You can go around yeah. and collect like, little parts of Baphomet. Hey, here's his arm. Hey, here's his white pebble. <laughs> yeah. uh, so who knows? You could, you yeah. could do something. I'm just imagining like SimCity <laughs> graphics. <you know>? yeah. <laughs> just like really brightly colored, but like just tunnels and, yeah. you know, like boiling hell and whatever the hell what, whatever's down there when like you know the, they, they, they put what's his butt the priest's hand into the water and oh, yeah, he burned the, me that's the blood of Baphomet there yeah. you go or, or you could play like Boone or Decker or the Sons of the Free you could just go around go. like here and shooting guns in the air <laughs> they can they can they can be like a little command conquer thing you just you know you move, oh, yeah, their, you move their pickup trucks around it could be a driving game where yeah, one of them one of them tried to drive into Midian or like his his truck goes into the <laughs> yeah. like, like for example you're driving the... you're driving on that old busted up car that Narcisse drives to bust uh, Boone out of jail yeah and you try to see how many sons of the free you could hit on the way to Midian <laughs> need, need for yeah. Pete Midian edition <laughs> like Narcisse your co-pilot and says go left go right and you boom boom you'd be like <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, you know, I, I wish someone would pay me for this stuff. Yeah, narcissist <laughs> yeah, game of unnecessary gold. surgery. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the next question, uh, Rachel Charlesworth asks. Uh, there is one very important question to discuss: the Blu-ray release, and she's talking about, of course, the Cabal cut. 
of Nightbreed. Um, we've talked about this a lot, but I would say, you know, we, we all want it to be as complete as possible. You know, nobody wants to see the director's cut go away. We just want to be able to watch this new version. Yeah. Are, so are the work prints, like, are they just, like, VHS tapes, or are they actual, like, film film, or...? It's it's VHS uh, source. So you basically right. be getting a Blu-ray print of VHS, so you, you could see all the, you know... According to Russell... Print. According to Russell, these tapes were done by uh, projecting actual film into a flatbed and then recording it with a camera for VHS. It's okay. kind of a pen and scan kind of thing. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> Russell has this thing. He calls it porno quality. <laughs> so, Excellent. <laughs> See, yeah. I kind of miss like the look of old, like messed up VHS stuff. I just bought a VHS player for my garage so I can use it to, to sample for, for music project stuff. Mm. And it. You know, there, 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 there's something about the, 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 the sound and the grain and sort of the, the, the artful cruddiness of, of VHS compared to DVD or Blu-ray. Just like I find myself missing it in, in some way. Yeah, I, oh, yeah. I miss so, oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Say again? I miss laser discs. Oh man! See, I never got the laser disc. Um, though we, um, I'll, I'll tell you where, where we, we see laser discs every week is our karaoke bar has a bunch of. Um, uh, laser discs in, in their library with oh. really really weird little movies to go along with the songs for, oh, for, yeah. for singing. Yeah, like but, little yeah, mountain the, backgrounds and stuff. Oh, it, no, it gets real strange. Like some of them are on YouTube. I should I should show them to you. Like like real just ridiculous. Exactly the kind of stuff that we'd be making fun of in high mm. school. Going what and what in the good lord is this? <laughs> uh, but yeah yeah and, and and like they still have a working laser disc player and then the karaoke DJ just like he loves his old gear. Like he has a laser disc player at home, so he's. He's, he's full of full of interesting info about it. But yeah, yeah. there's uh, uh, is, is anybody is anybody even still making the players anymore, or are they just basically just find them on eBay? It's a good I'm question. Sure. But uh, in, regards to the, in regards to the Blu-ray, it's like Ryan was saying. I mean, we all. I personally hope that uh, this this door opening from Morgan Creek allows the the search for the footage and, and film elements to continue. Um, yeah. But uh, even if even if for some reason they don't find it or they don't care to find it or whatever, and all we get is this VHS sourced reconstruction, the important thing is that this gets out there in some format, yeah. uh, because you know, in some commercial format, because then I always have this idea. I, I don't want to jinx it, but it's like. As long as there is a release of the footage officially, then you know fans can get to work on that, and they can then they can make whatever version of the movie that they want because they'll have more than one ending, they'll have more than one storyline that they can you know uh, edit in and stuff. So that would that would be fun to see what kind of fan edits will come out of this. Like the uh, people who edit out the um, Anakin Skywalker from the Phantom Menace. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they edited out Jar Jar Binks. They didn't edit out, edit out Anakin. That would have been really, really short if they edited out Anakin. 30 minute but, movie, yeah. But the Phantom Men, the Phantom uh, edits, the Phantom edits is the one where they just they either cut away Jar Jar Binks or they read other lines. I'm waiting for the one where they just edit George Lucas out of his own company. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So it's fun. I mean, I, I, I would like to see what, what people will come up with once they have a choice to edit in different elements of the film into their own fan version. That would be cool. Yeah. I, I never watch that kind of stuff. Oh, sometimes it makes them really, really better. Um, there are some fan edits which are va vastly superior to the finished product. Um, you know, I mean... Uh, I can give you some examples. Like there are some fan edits of Starship Troopers. Um, there are some fan edits done with, uh, um, you know, Star Wars. That that's you know, pretty common. Uh, also things with like Die Hard. Uh, there's just movie that 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 you know the fans just cut some scenes out, put some other deleted scenes in, and you know they just go around and mm. switch things here and there and sometimes mm. it may, it's just fun to watch it's just fun to watch because it's like you're watching a different movie for example Dune Dune is a movie that has so many different versions like the TV oh, version yeah, yeah. the European version there's like the theatrical there's like the one they released on DVD and Blu-ray uh, the screwball sci-fi channel one that's just 
Yeah. Like and terrible. there's a hugely extended Dune version, which was created by the fans. So that yeah. was a fan where they got all the little bits from all the different versions and they put it together as a big movie. So that's, that, cool. that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, our next question was um, Andrew Kopp said, I'm looking into getting a tattoo of Clive's art. Suggestions? Uh, I, I would say the best stuff for tattoo art on um, yeah, like I don't have Illustrator 2, that book, but mm-hmm. Illustrator 1 has incredible like stuff that would make great black work for, for a tattoo. That's, that's my recommendation. If you wanted a black, black and white tattoo or just, just black work on you. Mm. Get, get Illustrator, yeah. Don't don't get a tattoo before getting that book because that book just has so much, so many cool yeah. drawings, and and a lot of them are not. They're not. They're not. They're not all of of his sort of his his kind of native style. Some of them almost look like like little Picasso drawings. Like they're real. A lot yeah. of them are really loose, really really interesting and, and gestural. That's yeah, my that's my professional opinion. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. Tattoo, just go for something in black and white or something. I mean, unless you have a really good tattoo artist that you trust enough to make, like... Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, like Maureen gets oh. Aberat stuff on her. Yeah, she has she has quite a few Aberat tattoos, even a whole poem uh, tattooed on her back. Mm. That's pretty impressive. Oh, and, and you know, um, on uh, also Sicko Films... I don't. I, I forget now. I'm forgetting now what her real name is because I, I met her at a signing. But she has um, she has tattoos of, in Jumpish, you know, because the the Jump Tribe, uh, and the plushy Clive Barker plushies have a little book, a little storybook that has uh, that's written in Jumpish and it's got a little decoder thing like this letter is this and this letter is that. So oh, she really? has, she has tattoos in Jumpish, I think, on her back. Are the Clive Barker plushies all from Aberat? Uh, no, no, they're from a series called Jump Tribe that you know didn't that okay. didn't take off. So uh, okay. the, the ones there's that no, exist no, like, are, are just prototypes. There's no plushy Cenobite. <laughs> no. Well, no. Well, I've seen, I've seen I'm sure that stuff. would that would sell like crazy, like a little plushy yeah. Cenobite. That, yeah. Well, if you go on, <laughs> it might do some, uh, if you go on Etsy, you'll find lots of people making like pinhead plushies and baby oh, toys. Oh, I bet. Yeah. 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 So uh, it's all like, like horror dolls and stuff. Even there are, there, you know, bad taste bears. What? Bad taste bears. It's no. this, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's this uh, thing that you know they have like bears dressed in different uh, professions and stuff. There's like a, a sadomasochist bear and there's the leather bear. And there's a pinhead, there's a pinhead bear. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when I first saw um, the Build a Bear place. I thought it would be cool to fill one up with broken glass and fireworks. <laughs> this bear filled with dynamite. <laughs> I, I always wanted to do that to tickle me Elmo personally. <laughs> there is a video on YouTube of a tickle me Elmo on fire. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> don't don't destroy the Tickle Me Elmo. Just like I don't know, install Linux on it, and then you know, I mean, your your kids playing with Tickle Me Elmo, and then you know, yeah, and have them El- Elmo is now running Ubuntu. <laughs> yeah, and install Linux and have them start quoting like Richard Stallman. There you go. Don't drink bottled water. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Let's just finish it. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. So. um... <laughs> We'll skip that one. Roger says, I was going to mention the card game also since the podcast is about games. I wouldn't have to s- much to say on this one as I haven't really played either. My questions would be, <coughs> I've played Magic the Gathering and enjoyed it very much. Is the Magicka game similar and how were the reviews of the game itself? So I don't have any good answers for that because I only collect them. I don't play it. So I've never played the game. I don't know how it works. Oh, Really? Yeah, a friend of mine had some of the cards. Like he had, he had a set to play, but I don't, I don't remember. I mean, oh, I, I played really Magic played the Gathering, it. but I never played the Magic game. Yeah. You should show up on on Mark Miller's doorstep one day and say, "Hey, let's play a game." Yeah, that's a good idea. Probably, then probably, then uh, have to uh, study uh, the rules and stuff. The, the yeah. website Board Game Geek might have a review of it. Like they, they tend to aggregate like, uh, like reviews on their site. They're pretty. Um, they, they they tend to be pretty. Good about you know if a game is just not worth playing if it has like major design flaws like mm-hmm. Board Game Geek will be the kind of place where you go and people will go oh yeah that's that's got a major design flaw we've already figured that out you know but if it's a good game like they'll definitely you know they the they came up when I did tried to do a search for reviews to answer this question 
but I couldn't actually find the reviews. Oh know. yeah, it's it's it, it can be a complicated site. Um, yeah. I'm not I'm not really on it. I got on it like a long time ago and then just didn't do anything. With it. But, um, but yeah, it's good folks there. Could I ask you for one thing? Could you take a picture of that Magic and Matt thing, the game? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh, that'd be nice because I, I, you know, you're talking about it, and I have no idea how it looks like. So it's, just, yeah, it's it's a play mat on one side and then a poster on the other, with the oh. same um, same picture that's on the box, I think. Oh, that little flame thing. And, oh no, uh, no, it's different. I'm sorry. It, it's it's a face. I'll I'll, oh. I'll take a picture for the podcast. Thanks. So that's the thing. Fly Burger's that. like, where is this? <laughs> I want one of these. Yeah. It is a pretty cool picture. Uh, so next thing is, or the next question, Roger goes on to say, uh, also, has Clive Barker played the video games he helped to bring about or mentioned any others he has played? I would say no. Out of everything yeah, I've just, read, like I mean, he talks about how he thinks video games are, are neat, but I don't think he actually plays them. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe he plays them like... Uh when he visits the development team, maybe they show him something, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that could be, but I don't think that he would. he's playing video games at his house or anything. Right. I, I think that he just, like, probably looks at, you know, the other people playing them, or they show him when they're being developed. I don't know. Maybe he can play. I mean, hey, Clyde Barker loves to read comics, and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he played a few games, too. Yeah. He's of the era that is uh, that, that grew up without them. <laughs> so yeah. that, that that also changes things. Like I, I don't remember a time without them because I, you know, they've always been around. You know. Yeah, they, yeah, I know. Take an arcade when I was a little kid. You know. Yeah, I had an Atari Twenty Six Hundred. And, and and that thing was the best because everybody had one. Like yeah. like it was just the standard machine, so you just had oh, the library for the ages. You know, you could always swap games and. Someone was always selling games. And it was a cultural awakening to video games. Then there was video game crash and everything went crazy. Yeah. Okay, um, I think that's our last question. All right. Uh, well, it's, it's been fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we were uh, Jose Letao, uh, Matt Harpold, and I'm Ryan Danhauser. Uh, you can find us on the web at www.clivebarkercast.com. Uh, on iTunes, leave us a review. Uh, you can find us on... The, we have a Facebook page, or you know you can find us more often on the Occupy Median group. Uh, on Twitter, we're at BarkerCast or at Occupy Median. Uh, the forum is www.timewins.com slash Clive slash forum. And the official website for Occupy Midian is www.occupymidian.com. Uh, and you can hear more from uh, Crystal Rain, who brought us the, the, the uh, Occupy Midian report. You can find more from her at her website, which is www.bringbacknightbreed.blogspot.com.